Hare Krishna, Radhe Karaman Prabhu. Welcome to the Monks Podcast. Uh, it's been a desire to have you and many devotees since I started the Monks Podcast said that you, know, you are the be- one of the best persons for this. So I'm grateful that we could make it happen now. Uh, every Thank tradition so has its pride in its, you could say, wonder kids. So you are like that for our tradition. From the time I was introduced to Krishna Consciousness, I used to read your BTG articles. And then from a distance, I followed how you have gone from a devotional upbringing to become a well-established devotional scholar. So I think it's a trajectory that's an inspiration for many devotees and also many second, many, you could say third generation devotees, second generation devotees. So... Thank you for being who you are and thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. This is really an honor and a privilege to be here in conversation with you. Uh, I think um, I could give quite a long introduction for yourself and your wonderful qualities and accomplishments and contributions to our movement. But since you're in the role of interviewer uh, and not me, I'll, I'll avoid doing that. But just to say, that it's really a privilege to be here in conversation with you and to uh, have this opportunity to discuss some really interesting topics. Uh, And um, your podcast in general, I must say, I've met so many devotee friends of mine who have been really um, very uh, deeply affected by and grateful for the work you're doing in the Monks podcast. So thank you in particular amongst your many sevas for this seva. Uh, of doing the the podcast, and I'm really grateful that I can participate today. Thank you. So usually, when I do the po- podcast, I try to focus on that devotee's say area of specialization or, or area of experience. So I thought we could discuss. You know, you grew up in a very devotional background, and then, in some ways, you went into an academic environment, which is often quite critical of devotion. So in a sense, from an environment of faith, you went to an environment of reason, where reason is valued almost at the expense of faith. So you know that balance of faith and reason, it's a tension which every devotee faces, but I think you may have faced it in probably to a degree greater than most devotees. So I thought we could discuss about that topic today. Yes, definitely. That sounds good. So can we start with, maybe can you tell me a little bit about your upbringing? You know, I think you are the first in the second generation of homeschool devotees. And I have attended yours and your mother's seminar on homeschooling. So maybe you could tell a little bit about that. And then how you went into academia, what inspired you to do that, especially to religious studies? Yeah, actually, uh, Prabhu, the tension that you described in my life um, uh, uh, between faith and reason and that transition, uh, I think you you hit it spot on. I think it's very well described, articulated. Um, actually, my uh, childhood, as you stated, it was uh, it was in homeschooling. My parents homeschooled me, uh, and by home, uh, not just the home, uh, properly speaking, but the home as a temple, uh, because. My parents were running uh, a very nice temple in Boise, Idaho. And uh, uh, as the temple, as I grew up, the temple also grew up. And so we kind of grew together. And as a result of that, uh, um, we had a lot of opportunities. So first of all, my education itself was grounded in the study of Srila Prabhupada's books, especially Srimad Bhagavatam. And it is through the study of Bhagavatam that um, I... uh, I learned uh, English language skills and writing and, and comprehension and, and critical thinking. One of the things that my mother would do, which I think was really turned out to be the heart of, um, heart of our education and in many ways brought together uh, the faith and reason aspects very early on in my life uh, was the fact that we would read Bhagavatam together, seated in a circle, uh, uh, myself, my younger brother Gopal, and my mother, and we would read each one translation, and then um, uh, we would discuss. And the discussion wouldn't be in the mode of a teacher quizzing the student. 
what was this? Do you remember that? But it would be more with the idea of going deep into the text. And we would have the privilege of raising difficult questions just as much as my mother did. And so it became a real, um, you know, critical thinking and even debate sometimes exercise where there wasn't an assumption that um, we were going to, you know, get to the what the student had to find the one right answer uh, that that um, that the teacher was seeking, but rather that the teacher and the student were on a shared uh, journey of exploration through Srila Prabhupada's books. And from that experience, I developed a love for study of Srimad Bhagavatam in particular that has really um, sustained my Krishna consciousness for my entire life. And I think that early influence was possibly the most important aspect of my upbringing that I, I can remember. Uh, and uh, that, and then the temple uh, alongside it. That's fascinating. You know, one of the criticisms of, uh, say, homeschooling that is done is that often religious communities prefer that because they would like to indoctrinate their children in their own ideology. And in fact, there are atheists like Sir Richard Dawkins who calls it a form of child abuse to indoctrinate <laughs> a child in a, philo in a religion before they have the intelligence to choose it. But your education yeah. seems to have been very different. In fact, it was not so much, a, it was more like, as you said, raising questions and discussing. So, so, so uh, yeah, please. Uh, homeschooling can, can definitely have the negative aspects that you described. And I know of people who do it in that way. Uh, and they always make it into the news because the children were, as you said, abused in, in, in the context of being given a very, very, um, a stifled and, and, and limited scope and, and indoctrinated into a particular word. Perhaps uh, I think any form of education can become a, a negative experience for a child when not done correctly. But in our case, there were two things that um, uh, uh, helped avoid anything close to that. One was this process of critical reasoning and thinking and exploration that came from really what we can call a tutorial method of studying Prabhupada's books, uh, uh, where there's discussion and, and engagement. But then the other thing was the existence of the temple uh, and the fact that we, we had so many opportunities to express ourselves to newcomers, to the general public, uh, as we were one of the very few um, devotee, but also Indian, but also Hindu families in Boise, Idaho, this small town in the Northwest region of the United States. And as a result, we were invited in the town to pretty much any important event that happened, which had some cultural or religious aspect uh, to it. And um, the, uh, the, uh, so, you know, if, if there was a new memorial being established in town, or if there was a interfaith service happening or a Thanksgiving service or Christmas occasion, we were the Hindu family, we were the Indian family, we were sometimes representing all of Asia. So in this way, I, I, was, um, I was encouraged to express, uh, I was asked to express who I was uh, in many different contexts and having to say, this is my identity, this is why I'm a devotee, and this is what it means to be a devotee. And I think it's that process of continuously expressing myself to a variety of different audiences, Western, Indian, young, old, politicians, interfaith leaders, that, uh, that eventually led to my transition into the academic world. So it was less of a dichotomy as it might seem in the beginning. Okay. Because uh, in academia, in, in scholarship, the primary activity of teaching uh, is all about being able to express yourself and make yourself present in the classroom to your students. And I had been doing that since, I don't know, seven or eight years old, trying to explain and, and, and describe who I was. And that aspect of describing my identity to others, I think that's what eventually led me into uh, taking up the profession of teaching and scholarship. Interesting. So I can say that you were, by your education, you are protected, but you are not isolated. You are still connected with the community and you're contributing to the community. 
I think the real indoctrination happens when, when people are completely like in a cult sort of environment, disconnected from the rest of the world. But that never happened to you. So, yes. so no. I appreciate this point. We, we emphasize, my mother and I, we emphasize this many times in our, sorry, we emphasize this many times in our talk that homeschooling should not mean isolation. In fact, any form of education should not mean isolation. It means protection of the child, but not isolation. The two are very different things. Protection involves giving them uh, 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 opportunities to engage with the wider world in an environment of care where they always know that they are taken care of, they're protected and within certain boundaries. And boundaries are very important for children. So I think you've stated it very well that isolation is not uh, the answer uh, for any form of education. So did you grow up with a sense of we they mentality? Because in one sense, you were representing a distinctive religious group, you know, not Hindu, Indian, Asian, whatever you want to say. So, and there were others who are a different grouping. So sometimes the we they mentality can lead to the demonizing of the other. So did, how did you deal with that? Or did you encounter that at all? Um, I, I, I don't recall thinking about us and versus them uh, because, uh, you, you know, we, we were the, the them, who, the people who might be other to us. We were so closely engaged with them. I mean, in other words, we were meeting them on a regular basis. They were coming to the temple. So we had a sense that we were different and we were proud to be different. We understood the beauties and the advantages of Krishna consciousness, but we also recognize that there are people of other faiths and other backgrounds and people of no faith. And there were good people amongst them, right? That they weren't all bad or negative or horrible in some way. No, they were, everyone has goodness in them. And that was the point of connection. If you want to speak to someone, at an event, or we used to go to high schools, for example, and make presentations. You have to see where your audience is at, find what is good and positive and uplifting in them, and use that as your starting point for a discussion, for a connection. That's the job of a teacher. That's the job of a preacher. Uh, and otherwise, if we don't begin with where they are and see the goodness in them, then it becomes a, a, a download. Uh, where you're imposing your idea on them. And it, it, it may feel satisfying to, to you, but it has very little impact on the audience who, who mm. takes a defensive posture and says, oh, wait, you know, I, I don't want to be uh, attacked verbally through your ideas. I don't want your ideas to be imposed on mine. People want to see a connection. They want to see a relationship. They want to see where things... Uh, um, come together. And for that, the teacher must begin where the other person is at, not where they are at, where the other person is at. That's effective teaching. That's interesting. So in one sense, we can have a distinctive identity and recognize that others are different, but that difference needn't create either an insecurity in, in us that I am doing something wrong, nor does it have to create a judgmentality about others that you know they are wrong or they are down mm -hmm. there it is just that we are different and we have opportunity to connect them if they are interested it's a, it's a, it's a yes. challenge actually i would modify that yeah please yes no so, sorry uh, I, I think the delay caused uh, i uh, apologies but but uh, i think the I, I think i would modify that a little bit that it's not just that we are different and equal i think as, uh, as devotees, and I think this is true of any person of faith, uh, that ultimately, if you're grounded in a tradition, there have to be reasons why you consider your tradition to be special, to be unique, right? And, and, and why, why you, you, you choose to be grounded in that tradition. So it's, it's not just in terms of separate but equal or different but equal, but there is a sense that Yes, Krishna consciousness includes uh, other expressions or it can understand other expressions or there are aspects of Krishna consciousness which are special and unique. But that does not prevent ourselves from looking at others 
and their love and affection for God and saying that there is also something unique there. And by appreciating it, even though that is not my tradition and my preferred way of loving Krishna, but by seeing their love for God, their love for Krishna, I can grow appreciation of my own deity, right? And my own way of loving Krishna by seeing, oh, there's another aspect to my Lord, which is so beautiful and so special, right? So it's a process of mutual growth. And, and there is a sense of, of, of specialness or uniqueness to your tradition. Uh, that is why I'm grounded in it. But that uniqueness and, and, and greatness of your own tradition, as you said, does not entail putting someone else down, right? This is a form of, of, of uh, psychological weakness, even in an, ind in an individual. If my sense of self-esteem can only be held by putting down others, only when I look at you and I see your faults, then I feel good about myself. Such a person is considered to be a psych... There's some issue there, right, that needs to be resolved. My sense of self-esteem does not have to be based on your... Uh, um, uh, faults. Uh, we can both have a healthy sense of esteem and I can appreciate who you are while also recognizing that I have certain abilities and certain opportunities to give uh, 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 to others, right? Yes, that's true. So same as with religion. Yeah, I agree. I, I, I don't think I said the word equal because that is, that is almost uh, like a, a de depersonalizing all paths. And it's almost in the name of equality, we strip all paths of potency. We can't say that yes. it's simplistically everything is equal. What I meant to say is what you again articulated that, you know, sometimes if someone else is correct, that makes me feel insecure. Am I wrong? To prove that I am correct, somebody else has to be wrong. So there can be different paths to Krishna. That's true. So now, so moving on, how did you choose uh, to enter into religious studies? In general, Indians go into STEM fields. And um, I remember one devotee, he told me that he wanted to enter into religious studies and his mother, she reacted as if he was going to become Brahmachari. He said, if you don't go study engineering, I'm going to commit suicide. So eventually he studied engineering only. But so was there... A, uh, I said, because you grew in America, maybe that career pressure to become an engineer or doctor might not have been there. But still, religious study, how did you choose religious study specifically? Yeah. So uh, I actually, um, uh, my, um, I'm very grateful to my parents for uh, being open to this uh, career. Not only being open, but encouraging me. Uh, my mother and father both. I remember... Um, when I was first considering uh, doing a career in uh, Sanskrit uh, and religious studies, my father um, visited uh, Harvard University. He was on a business trip to Boston and he decided, why don't I go over to go to the Sanskrit department and just meet with the chair, the professor and see if they would, it would be a good place for Ravi to uh, come and join. And so, uh, uh, and, and I think my mother accompanied him on that trip. And uh, anyway, they sat down in front of the chair of the department and he told them, do you know that you are the first um, set of Indian parents who has come to me looking for a place in Sanskrit for their son? And they were surprised. They said, really? And, mm -hmm. and you know, this is Harvard. So we're not talking about some small university that no one would want to go to. I mean, which this is like is? The, the dream. Indian. Ha Harvard, Harvard. So which university. year? Which year? Department of Sanskrit. So I, I can't remember now. I, I must have been, so my trajectory was, what I went to the university a little early. So um, this that's was looking for graduate school. Yeah, that's an <laughs> understatement. It's a humble understatement, so, you know. <laughs> so... <laughs> What age did you go? Uh, so I think that I started at 12. Um, and um, uh, actually, I was almost 13. I was almost 13. And I graduated when I was 17. So this was just before I finished my undergrad, I think. Maybe I was 16, something like that. Uh, and, um, and so this is now, what, 22 years ago. 
and uh, maybe th uh, things have changed a little bit. But then he, the other thing he said, he said, uh, uh, do you realize that if, you, um, uh, if your son goes into studying Sanskrit, you will be feeding him for the rest of your life? <laughs> he was really testing. He was really testing my parents to say, because he, he didn't believe. He didn't believe that they were actually serious, that I was serious about this possibility. So he was not joking or he was joking in some way, but not entirely. Yeah, halfway joking. I mean, okay. it's, it's, That's true. it's not a clear career path, you know, uh, in yeah. the way that it is for an engineer where you just go. So to this day, I mean, the vast majority of Indian kids in the United States or anywhere uh, go into, or I try at least to go into fields like engineering or medicine or, or law or something like that. Uh, but, but, but anyway, so, but my own love for Sanskrit came from, uh, and for religious studies came from childhood, uh, from my Sanskrit teacher. Uh, my parents were able to find a wonderful Sanskrit teacher named Gary Thomas. Uh, he was a colleague of my father's at Hewlett Packard. And uh, when, when they discovered that he knew Sanskrit and he wanted to teach Sanskrit, he had actually taught himself. Uh, how uh, Sanskrit very, very well and was self, self-taught scholar. And, uh, and so he was eager to teach and we were eager to learn. So he would come once a week to Govinda's restaurant uh, and uh, enjoy the food there. And then we would sit and we would study for um, an hour officially, but it would go on for two or three hours. And it was just, it was something that I fell, I, I, I came to love very, very early on, uh, and just could not get enough of. I mean, every grammatical rule and every exception, I would just, uh, you know, memorize and, and, uh, and discuss, and I loved it. And at, at that point, I, I started to realize that I could actually have a career uh, doing what I loved. And that's when I started to go in the direction of religious studies. There was no religion program at Boise State University. So instead, I went into philosophy, which was excellent training uh, in terms of uh, good critical reasoning, thinking, writing, understanding arguments. And then uh, from there uh, to Oxford University for the master's and PhD, and this time in religious studies in Hinduism in particular. So Oxford means Oxford Center for Hindu Studies? Um, so we were admitted to Oxford University, Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, does not admit its own students. Yeah, of course. Uh, we, uh, then we received uh, some of our teaching and instruction and guidance uh, from the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies, but most importantly, our uh, uh, Vaishnav community, that it, it really, uh, Shona Krishi Prabhu there has cultivated a community of scholar practitioners, which is so rare to find. I, looking back, I realized that that was one of the most important factors in me being able to maintain my Krishna consciousness while pursuing rigorous uh, academic study was the fact that I had a community of Vaishnav scholars to do that uh, in. Uh, I had good role models and good associates and friends uh, with whom I could pursue that. And that was invaluable. I mean, I, I, I cannot uh, over estimate uh, the, the um, importance of the Oxford Center in, in my Krishna consciousness, as well as in my academic development. So thank you for sharing this journey. So during your studies, did you, do you remember any specific moments when, say, your studies challenged your faith in a very strong way? And uh, so, so have you, now, at one level, the tension between faith and reason is a ongoing experience for us as uh, devotees and especially as intellectually oriented devotees. So I had an earlier podcast with Krishna Kshetra Maharaj, where he mentioned that you know, faith and doubt, they continue to have a dialogue in the hearts of a seeker. So it's not that faith permanently defeats doubt. It goes on. But there are some moments of uh, special tension. And then how does one go about resolving that? 
do you did you have any such ex, such experiences specifically so i i i wouldn't say that there were some like key moments where it was really like uh, uh you know a, a moment of tension or explosion or self doubt it it was more like um you know a constant uh knocking a constant hammering a constant drip 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 of this tension uh that was that's always been there and and uh, always really been part of both my academic pursuit and my krishna conscious life that tension between faith and reason or faith and doubt or maybe instead of tension we can say that dialogue that dialectic uh, that debate has always been there uh, and it comes up in different ways at different places sometimes in relation to the question of dating for example that's an early one mm-hmm. where anyone into academia even if they don't go into academia they watch it from a distance they go wait they date the vedas differently than we date them uh, or the question of historicity uh, are these stories are they historical truths or not does the view of history match the bhagavatam's view of history or uh, um questions of of um eternal truth versus relative truth uh um uh, and and temporary truths the question of of the origin of truth is truth created by human beings is it a human phenomena religion or is it a divine phenomena is it golokera premadhana harinam sankirtan or is this a sociological event that takes place because of certain historical contexts and reasons this last one i mentioned was is probably uh, the 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 historical issues and the dating issues are an initial shock that seem big but in the end they become rather small over time and the question of just a minute um, it becomes small yeah. because you realize it doesn't matter in the big scheme of things you know yeah. I, i read one scholar on hinduism he says that when the hindu epics were written is not as important as what is written in them so in a sense the date line for the wisdom doesn't matter as much as the wisdom itself is that why that is not so big or how how how, how does that work so so what that that scholar described i mean i i think that's a that's a, a typical um you know kind of liberal hindu way of of approaching the dating question and it, it, okay i mean it is true that the content is very important and the date is less important but i think it's not just that i think uh, the question of dating historicity we have to go back to the very nature of the issue and ask ourselves why and when does it become such a big issue for our faith uh because here's the thing uh, we have to we have to question the question itself this is what i mean to say the question of dating when we raise it we have to question that because we so many of us work in a environment that is saturated by the judeo christian tradition mm. and is true even in india because while the numbers may be small but the reality is everyone in the modern world uh works in a context where the west and its framework of thinking is supermost it's it's kind of overarching it's always present and we're always working in relationship with it and this is true in india for reasons of colonialism but also reasons of modernity uh, that are present to this day and of course here in the united states this is always the case and for the judeo christian tradition god reveals truths through history history itself is the work of god over time you can see what he wants through the movement of history history is his hand at work and therefore the question of when something happened where it happened exactly where is the evidence the historical evidence for that question is crucial to the faith of christians this is this is um very uh important to remember and this is why there's been such excellent um uh uh historical work done in the middle east for example 
I remember the first time when I, um, uh, when I was studying world religions in an academic context, uh, there's the question of the destruction of the second temple. This was a major event in the history of Judaism. Judaism yeah. Remember, scholars were debating. It happened in 70, in the year 70 CE, and scholars or AD, and the scholars, they were debating, did it happen in the first six months of the year or the second six months of the year? And I remember going, really? I mean, you have the ability to figure things out that closely? Do you know that in Indian studies, in Sanskrit studies, if we can date a text to within two to 300 years, we consider ourselves very accomplished, right? So if a scholar says that the, the, this text was written between 200 BC and 200 AD, that's a 400 year spectrum. We think we, we did very well, right? Now you come later in history, it's a little easier uh, to date things. But the point being is that this is not just, initially scholars saw this as merely a failure on the part of the Indian mind to not be able to record dates properly. But we have to recognize that there is a fundamental difference in intellectual uh, uh, focus, in orientation. That for, from the perspective of a Vedic culture, from the perspective of Vaishnav culture, history is moving, but it's not moving anywhere in any one direction. It's going in circles. And the same ideas return, the same people return over, the Lord returns again and again through avatars. Scriptures are revealed and then they disappear and then they're revealed again. And so when there's a difference, a problem, for example, uh, there's two different varahas. One is described as white and the other is described as red. The acharyas say, oh, this is kalpa bheda. Right? This is a difference in, in different, yuga, different cycles. So the, both things could have happened. One happened in this cycle, one happened. So there's no need to identify exactly. This is the spot. This is the time. This is the date. Because it's that question is not part of our, not just faith, our cosmology. Our cosmology does not necessitate looking, history is not going anywhere. It's going in circles, right? We are going somewhere through the circles of history. But history as a major phenomena is not moving in one, one direction. It's going to be wrapped up and then it's gonna start all over again, right? So our cosmology does not support a, a, emphasis on the question of dating and historicity. I do not mean to say by this that Vaishnavas do not think the, that these leelas or these activities actually happened. Of course they happened. And I think those who say that, oh, this is all mythology, but the truths within them are important. Mm -hmm. I think they are missing something very important. This is a modern view that is not held by any of our acharyas. So it is true. It happened. It is historical truth. But when it happened, where it happened exactly, and where's the archeological evidence? These are questions that have never been important until the arrival of Christianity on the scene. Then we adopt that sense of importance and we learn, we are taught that your faith must depend upon uh, the, um, uh, the, 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 the ability to date the text as the text itself says that unless we can find archeological evidence for that dating, your faith has no basis. And my question is why today should we base our faith on that point when it has never been based, when that has never been the basis of our faith? It has been the basis of other people's faith, but not ours. So why should we do it today? That's a very striking way of putting it. I've also read about this, how the fundamental conceptions of time in say the Abrahamic religions and the Dharmic religions are different. And they lead to, we could say something like some sort of history, history centrism in the Abrahamic religions. But let me understand this, what you said, that the question of time is a question of time in itself needs to be questioned. So certain questions gain important importance because of certain presumptions. And those presumptions themselves are questioned and the question it becomes not that important. 
so we could say if we have something like a pendulum we could say that literal historic precise historicity is like one extreme unless this is right and then the everything is wrong the other extreme we could say is like complete mythology saying that you know this never happened but what is taught through it is important so in between we could say this happened however we we fully assert that it happened but when exactly it happened and what is the evidence for the fact that it happened at that time that is not as important as what is taught through it yes very very nicely put prabhu very nicely put in this regard can i share with you one conversation uh, from shila prabhupad i i think it illustrates my point very nicely that this is not just some academic intellectual point i'm making which i came up with in the middle of the night this is really i mean an essential part of our tradition and you and i both know how emphatic shila prabhupad was about the fact that these are not our our kathas our our scriptures are not just mythology mm. in the cheap sense of being fake and fiction fiction yeah. story right he was very emphatic about this point so using that as the basis now i want to read this one conversation or show you this one conversation uh, with that as the starting point so you can see how striking it is what prabhupada is saying here okay so this is a a morning walk conversation and pro this is a uh, prabhupada is discussing uh, in regard to publishing with some of his editors so jai dwaita maharaj is there and others are there uh, so Uh, I'll just read from the top. It's not very long. No, please. Uh, Yeshoda Nandan uh, Prabhu says, "Prabhupad, there has been discussion amongst many of the members of the press and the Sanskrit editors regarding the actual place of Nursinga's pastimes. So I told them that on the occasion of our travel to South India, we visited this place, a hobilam, and the panditas they have scriptural reference from the Brahmanda Puran." and nursinga puran that the place is actually mentioned there in it, and it has been recognized by ramanuja acharya and many of the great alwar saints and yourself have already told me twice personally that this was the actual place where it happened and on top of the mountain there there is the pillar iron pillar which is the symbol of the spot where lord nursinga killed hiranyakashipu so for the benefit of all these devotees they were just requesting your actual confirmation prabhupad confirmation or no confirmation nisingadev is our worshipable deity that's all why are you bothering where he, where he killed hiranyakashipu you worship him that's all uh, yashoda nand they they just wanted jaidwait the uh, uh, the question came up because they have some pictures photographs from these place Uh, from these places and we wanted to know if they were suitable for publishing or not prabhupad so why you are bothering with that let it be accepted or not accepted worship him akshayananda not that important prabhupad this is the important thing a man is diseased he has gone to the physician so whether is the first duty to investigate where from the disease has come to or to cure him which is important to cure similarly nishingadev might have done this or here or there but he is our worshipable deity that's all why bother with unnecessary things we know nishinga is everywhere andan tarastha paramanu chayan that is the conclusion jaya dwaita we were just afraid that if we published a picture that was not correct you might become then you then you might become like nishingadev Prabhupad, Jaya Dwaita. We were afraid that if we were to publish a picture that is not correct, Prabhupad. So when it is disputed, why should you publish that picture? It is controversial. You should not print. Yashoda Nandan. The controversy is only among the Prabhupad. Whatever it may be, as soon as there is little controversy, I explained yesterday. And then Prabhupad goes on to describe the uh, crow and uh, tal fruit. a uh, logic that uh, um yes. i'm going to skip skip down a little bit uh, to propas uh, uh conclusion on this point he says as soon as there is some controversy avoid it that's all tal fruit and crow 
You worship nursing a dev. Ito nursing up para to nursing off. Yato yato yami tato nursing up. Nursing dev is everywhere. By here nursing o hidaye. Why nursing dev should be confined? He was here. He is everywhere. As he is everywhere, he is here also. That's all. Finish the business. Beautiful. So, you know, I remember when we had gone to Ahobilam, Radhanath Maharaj, Guru Maharaj had taken us to that place and we were researching Ahobilam. I had come across this conversation and uh, it is striking, but placed in this context. So, two things came to my mind while I was reading it just now. You're reading it. First is that we could even, somebody might even debate the, his, the, the say, the geographical accuracy of something like Vrindavan also. Hmm? But some things are central and we won't. Uh, so there, if we have to quote controversy, we may, we may still defend that this is Vrindavan where Krishna's pastimes happened. But those which are not so clearly emphasized, say in our scriptures or in our tradition. So then to get involved in that controversy might not, uh, is something which is distracting. Am I understanding this right? Yeah, I think it's very well stated Prabhu. If, if you see what Prabhupada is doing, means it is clear that he is not against the idea that Lord Nishingadev appeared in Akhobila, right? Means Yashoda Nandan Prabhu says that you mentioned it twice and Prabhupada does not deny it. Uh, at, at the same time, Throughout the conversation, I mean, Yashodananda Prabhu is giving so much evidence, right? Alvars, yourself, Ramanujacharya. But throughout the conversation, Prabhupada is insisting on this point. Not that he's not denying that it happened, number one. He would never do that. Like we said, he, he did not uh, consider, no Vaishnava Acharya considered these stories to be fiction. Okay? So he's not denying that they happened. He's not denying that this was the place it happened. But he's denying the fact that you are giving so much importance to this question of location, the historical question. Why are you giving so much importance when our philosophy is ito nasinga parato nasingo yato yato yami tato nasinga. The nasinga dev is everywhere. Even on the point of Vrindavan that you just said, Prabhu, means we are convinced Krishna appeared. We are convinced he appeared here because Mahaprabhu revealed it. The six Goswamis revealed it. But even there, notice the difference in how we see that historical location uh, uh, compared to just regular, we can say, academic history, right? Or Western intellectual history. When we look at Vrindavan, we say, this is the location where Krishna performed his pastimes. But you cannot see it by examining the dust or examining the ruins. That is not what will allow you to see it. What allows you to see it is by having Premanjana Churito Bhakti Vilochanena. With those eyes of love, that spiritual vision, then you can see the actual Vrindavan, which is covered over by the current vision that you have, right? So we hear, for example, that Radha Kund from Vrindavan Mahimamrita, Radha Kund's banks are covered with stone that is gems and coral and rubies and all of that. It is, it is, it's, it's an amazing place, not made of sandstone, mm. right? So is this Radha Kund? Yes, it is Radha Kund. But to see it, you need to be, go beyond history, right? You need to transcend history. It's a, it's a, a, a trans-historical perspective, I should say. Not ahistorical, because we believe it is historical. Right? It's not non-historical. It's trans-historical. It starts with a historical location, but it goes far beyond it. And that's what Prabhupada is arguing in this conversation. He's saying, our perspective is trans-historical. So why are you limiting Nisingadev to the point of Aho Ahobilam, that pillar, as his point of origin and his location? Okay, that, I love these terms. I have used a historical and trans-historical, but non-historical is a good addition to it. So... Mm -hmm. So, trans-historical, the way you say it is, that history is just, a, we could say, a, a exit point or a takeoff point for us to go into a higher reality. And that 
higher reality is what is more important for us so when you said that our scriptural description of of radha kund is different from our physical vision so that means the because the reality is much more than the physical so fighting over the physical is not as they say this is not the hill i want to die on exactly. so in that sense don't get into don't get into a fight that is not important isn't it yes precisely very well well put prabhu yeah. this is not the hill i want to die on and that's what i realized early on in my academic study that this question as i mentioned earlier this question of historical dating historical location it it shows up early on and it seems like this is the end of my faith you know we say 5000 years they say 2500 years and and it's just like okay and then and then you you start to wonder uh, when when did it become so important to my faith the exact year of the text composition all throughout my childhood this was never a topic of our conversation in any bhagavatam class i attended or discussion except when we were discussing specifically academic history right otherwise it was never a topic of discussion it was never important and when have i made it all important this is not my question this is someone else's question that i have decided and to to make important for me that has been imposed upon me willingly in most cases and i think this is the key thing about faith and reason is that we have to be willing to set the terms of the discourse first this is the biggest mistake that people make when we go into insider outsider debates academic non academic debates is that uh, faith versus reason faith versus scholarship is that we we don't set the terms of the debate we don't we don't it's like it's like you know taking someone else's exam the 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 questions have been set for you and and someone else is marking the exam and you're asked to sit and take the exam why should we be in that position if we want to be a dialogue partner between faith and reason then we have to have input in what will be the questions that are set on the exam and who is going to be marking this exam right and then we can take the exam because we know that it is on terms that we are appreciating that we are understanding otherwise it becomes a very very difficult proposition right if we don't we have to first interrogate the terms of the discourse and that is something that we learn very early on when we go into this academic context is that the most important thing about the debate is not who answers is not what the answers are right that's not the most important aspect of the debate the most important aspect is what are the questions being asked and if you have input on the questions then the answers are not that difficult frankly speaking i mean they're difficult yeah this is a good example the battle is won <laughs> yeah this is a good example uh, but i think i'll need a little more unpacking that uh, setting the terms of the debate so are we the two three different things over there one is when we when we want to have a debate the what are the common authorities that we accept it like if i am arguing based on scripture and you don't accept scripture or if i am arguing based on science and you don't really give credence to science then what what is that is one thing what is it what is that we agree upon but i think what you are saying with respect to set the terms of the debate is that uh every study involves some driving questions and uh, and while doing that study many other questions can also come up but we need to focus on our driving questions and for that the one of the things which i talk about intelligence now krishna talks about uh, knowledge and intelligence in the 18th chapter in the three modes so one aspect of intelligence i see it is that to understand what is central and to hold on to it and to understand what is peripheral and to let go of it so when you say set the frames of the de- uh, debate are you talking about this point of central and peripheral so and but how much control do we have no, because 
the syllabus is decided by when you more or less the books that we read are decided so how how do we control the terms of the debate so b both of your your questions are excellent prabhu uh, on the on the first one i would but what i mean by the terms of the debate is what you said earlier about assumptions there are certain assumptions that are presupposed behind any question that is asked hmm. and to uncover those assumptions and ask ourselves are these the right assumptions the starting points the axiomatic truths the perspective the world perspective that i want to begin with or is this something that i have adopted without a proper consideration right and and uh so i i'll i'll give you one example i i used to uh, uh take my uh, students to uh visit uh different places of worship of uh, as part of their world religions class okay now when we went to the hindu temple a young man this was not in his con temple uh but a uh, a a very nice young man also a college student i uh, gave my students a tour of the uh of the temple and at the end he asked for questions and one of the students they asked the question um so can you tell me your your main beliefs that make you a hindu and the boy said oh good question and then he thought and then he struggled and he said well um we're uh, vegetarians a uh, wait that's not a belief right um so we do a uh, puja every day at home a uh, wait that's not a belief um so he eventually got a few things but afterwards he came up to me and he said professor gupta um what was the right answer to the question uh, you your professor please help me for next time and i said you know it's not a question of the right answer you have to question the question itself here's the issue protestant christianity defines its faith based on beliefs these if you believe these four or five things you are a christian we have never defined ourselves based on belief alone beliefs are important but practice is just as important even perhaps a little bit more we see the character of the sadhu that's how we know this is a sadhu then we investigate oh what is your exact theology vedanta this that but first we must see the character of the person right their lifestyle their behavior so i said immediately you should when the question arises you should say actually besides the belief i want to tell you what is important to me as a hindu what makes me a, a hindu and the practice our lifestyle is just as important so this is an example of what i mean is that embedded in the question was certain assumptions about religion and it's the ability to uncover those assumptions and question them that is what i mean by setting the frame the terms of the discourse mm, is beautiful this is to your first question now so, to so, your second yeah go ahead just to apply this to our previous discussion so if somebody asks you know where is the evidence that this happened 5000 years ago when all the evidence says this is 2500 years ago so then then the answer would be that you know that that evidence is not what is uh, central either to my tradition or to my faith so by faith you are using it in a broad sense like we could talk our faith tradition you are using faith in a broader sense and belief in a smaller sense of what we believe whereas faith is like the whole culture culture scripture practice everything combined together is that yes. right when you differentiate faith and belief yeah uh, with so so just on one thing i on a practical level i would turn the question on that person i would say why is this evidence so important to you you're asking for the evidence why is it so important to you and make them search themselves to raise the question oh why is this evidence so important oh because unless you can point to the evidence how can you believe it and that's where i would say ah that that leap is not true for us right that we don't need to dig in the ground to find the piece of pottery that gives me faith 
that this is actually the truth. That has never been our, our model of understanding. That has not been our epistemology in the, in the Vaishnava tradition. And, and, and for us, there are other things that are more important in terms of appreciating the evidence, in terms of building our faith. So, um, uh, so yeah, but, but now to, to your question about, about uh, is that what faith is? So, so this is a, a really... Just one minute. Yeah. To turn the question yeah. around, then that really begs the question. So, you know, is your faith not based on facts? Or is it that it is not based on these particular facts? Yes. The latter. The latter. It, the fact that in, in, there is the uh, uh, um, Vaidusha Pratyaksha, Jiva Goswami says, this is the basis of Shastrik evidence, that it is the Pratyaksha, the direct experience of those who are Vaidusha, those who are self-realized, those who are advanced devotees. So that is, that is a fact, right? born from the experience of the, 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 the sage, the visionary sage. Mm. is a form of evidence. Digging in the ground is another form of evidence. Searching through texts for manuscripts for finding the date of it at the end, that is another form. Means there are many forms of facts, many forms of evidence. The question is exactly what you said, that it's, it's, it's which ones are we going to place importance? It's not that... Our faith is unfactual. No, it is factual. But which facts are we basing it on? You have decided that a certain body of facts is the most important, and you're going to judge me based on those, that body of evidence. Why should I use that as the standard, the measure? That is simply giving you the power to determine my faith, right? And when that has never been the measure of my faith or the faith of my ancestors, my acharyas. So now Vaidusha Pratyaksha, that is just faith based on other faith. It's almost like you're building a building a sandcastle upon sandcastle. Because my faith in the realities of this is based on my faith in the reality that they have perceived this. And, their and I have faith that their perception is perception is supernatural. So in a sense, uh, it almost uh, it almost becomes faith in the absence of facts that are verifiable by us. Mm. Mm. There, there, there is no faith in the absence of facts that are verifiable. And I think this goes to your second second question to me, which was, what is the nature of faith, right? And this is, of course, a very deep and very difficult question that has been. Volumes of books have been written about it in every religious tradition, right? So there's so much to be said, but let me say a few words in terms of how I have understood in my own mm. experience and practice in the past few years. And I would say that, that we make a mistake when we think that faith is even possible without, uh, in, a, without in, a, in, a, in, a, in a purely blind way, subtracted, from everything else around it. Faith is something that is composite, right? Faith is something that has many different pieces to it that come together to create faith, right? So you have uh, Shastric knowledge. Gyan is part of faith, right? Not all kinds of Gyan. Certain kinds of Gyan are detrimental to faith, but without knowledge, Samanda Gyan at least, there's no such thing as faith. Experience is a part of faith. Only knowledge from a book is not going to build faith. You cannot call that faith. That's called information. It's called learning. It's called rote, but it's not faith. Faith has to have some experience paired with that knowledge. Hmm. To include some wonder in it, some sense of mystery, right? So just experience and just knowledge is not enough. There has to be some sense of promise, some wonder there that what I am studying is more than I can, I can um, wrap my head around, that I can perceive and understand, right? So faith has many pieces to it. And sometimes one piece may be a little weak. And so we say my faith is not steady. But it is a mistake to think that faith is 
what is left over. So, so some people think if you remove knowledge, you remove evidence, you remove experience, then, and you still believe, then that is faith. No, no, that, 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 is, that, is, that is cheap fanaticism, right? That is cheap sentimentality, which will definitely not last unless the other things are there, right? So faith is something that is composite. It's all these pieces put together. And sometimes the knowledge, the evidence, the fact side can be a little bit, you know, it can get shaky. Uh, and of course, this is, I mean, my experience in going into academic world, sometimes there are times where the fact side start to, you know, wobble a little bit. And so you have to lean more heavily on the side of experience and say, you know, I, I know Krishna. He's, he's, he's had an impact on my life. I've perceived him, not face to face, but I know that he's present. His hand, at least, I've perceived in my life. Mm. The misdemeanance is there that you have to lean, that Krishna, I cannot know him fully. So I'm willing to accept a little bit of a gap in the intellectual side for now. Sometimes the intellectual side is very solid. Uh, I've got all the Shastric quotes and I understand it and all the facts are there. But something of experience is missing. You wonder, is there really Krishna? I mean, I understand it theoretically, but is actually is this you know is this a fact? Is Krishna there? Is 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 there heaven and hell and Yamaraj and all of devas and is this a, so? There's no there's not enough experience to to support that you know. So when we say that my faith is shaky, we have to understand that it's not one monolithic thing that, ah, it's falling, it's falling, oh, no, it's falling. It's not like that. There's different components. And, and when one component is shaky, which is natural, we just have to lean more heavily on the others. Beautifully put, and, yeah. Right? Wait until the, if the other side is again strengthened. Just like when I have pain in one leg, then I lean more heavily on the other leg, allowing that one to recover in due course. Of you know, one of the talks and the seminars I do is on centering our faith on Krishna, centering ourselves on Krishna. So I talk about Krishna is the center. And then we can have broadly four, there can be many, but if four, you know, you can have a intellectual pathway to Krishna. You can have a cultural pathway to Krishna. You can have a social pathway to Krishna. Mm. And you can have an emotional or experiential pathway to Krishna. Mm. So now, some people for them, now everybody has all the components, but for some people, something would be very prominent. Say for somebody whose primary pathway to Krishna is intellectual, then if there is some question for which you just, the answer doesn't make sense or you don't have an answer, that disturbs them a lot. But for somebody whose faith is not coming from them, why do you worry so much about this question? Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, somebody for whom, Say the social pathway is important. That means, say how nice devotees are, or how saintly my my spiritual teachers are, and then they find somebody's behavior questionable. Then it's like everything comes shattering down for them. So, so in that sense, I like this idea of faith as a as a composite, and all these are there. And maybe for each individual, the percentage of each might be different. Yeah. And we all need to, we will have one primary aspect, but we also need to develop the other aspects so that we can turn to it when necessary. Yes. And therefore, on a practical level, we should nourish that side, which is not our strength, right? Which is not our initial predilection, because you never know when you will need it. Right now, your favorite side, you know, if, if like, if your intellectual is the primary path, TK, it's strong, it's good, you're feeling confident. But you never know when Krishna is going to pull the rug out from under your intelligence, right? And you're, you're <laughs> unstable. And so it's, it's so important to nourish the other sides, you know? And so in my own personal practice, I always try to make sure that that non-intellectual aspect of faith is always nourished. It's always uh, uh, that I see that side of Krishna also that is engaged with rasa, that is emotion, that is experience, that is the character of Vaishnavas, that is the aspect of sitting humbly and allowing yourself to accept in a mood of wonder and mystery and appreciation without necessarily relying always 
on the intelligence uh, to boost up that faith, right? So we have to be proactive about it. We have to uh, nourish that side of our faith. You know, if we think in these four pathways, if we think of them as four legs of, of, a, of a chair, of a stool, of a table, then if one is weak, then we have to support that one more. So that if in any case one starts to weaken, we have strength in the others. Uh, all the four of them are, are abil- uh, have, uh, for any individual, one side of their body is stronger than the other, right? Unless you're Arjun, then he's Savya Sachi, he's ambidextrous. But, but for most people, it's one side is stronger than the other. So therefore, physical therapists will tell you, you have to do exercises for the other side, not for the strong side, for the other side, to make sure that your body is properly balanced. Well, in principle, I appreciate this. But say some devotees, they, they get their nourishment primarily from studying Bhagavatam. Then it, our lives are so fast paced and there's not, we don't have an unlimited amount of time. So if we tell them to get into elaborate deity worship, because that is the cultural side also, then that also takes time. So when you say that we need to strengthen the other side, what, what exactly do you mean by that? means we make a conscious endeavor to deepen our appreciation for that side. So we Just may like, not ourselves practice it in an extensive way, yes. but at least we appreciate that. Yes, that we make sure that it is incorporated into our lives, that we appreciate and try to understand devotees for whom that is their area of uh, nourishment and strength, right? In this way, we are always um, in touch with the other aspects of bhakti as well. This is why the nine processes of bhakti, even though one is sufficient, but the nine should be appreciated as a whole, as a group. The five most potent aspects of bhakti, one is sufficient and each one of us will have our love in, that, in those five, our area of strength. But the others should be appreciated. They should be considered as a group, not an exclusion because you don't know when your relationship with your, with your, de- with your deities will be your, your lifesaver. Uh, uh, even though your, your constant a- affection is for studying Bhagavatam, but you never know when your relationship with your deities, even though that is not the focus, your deity puja is not the focus of it, but it, it may one day become your, your lifesaver. Right? True. So... You know, I think uh, this is very fruitful discussion till now. So you said that actually the basis of the historical facts is one thing. We were discussing about setting the frames of the debate. And then from your perspective, did we complete that discussion or you want to add something more on this? So, so there were two places, Prabhu, where you, you gave uh, a couple of things and then we, we went in one direction very fruitfully, as you said. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, I, I think you, you asked uh, the question of, of how, how do we... Yeah, how much do we control the frames, how control yes. the uh, frame of the debate? Yes, yeah. yes. And, and uh, that question we didn't get to. So I just want to say a couple of words on that. Yeah. And uh, this is that um, um, in order to set the, ter- to change the terms of the debate, one has to be an insider to the debate. Uh, you can do it from the outside also. Uh, with outside, uh, so, so by, by outside, I mean this. In any field of knowledge, okay, whether it's religious studies like me or whether it's, it's uh, you know, in any kind of intellectual discussion or even in any kind of social arena, there are certain assumptions Uh, under which people operate. This is human nature. There's nothing wrong about it. But if you want to question those assumptions, you can question them from the outside. You can stand up and you can protest. You can say, this is is, uh, wrong. You should not do it. Just like people, Hindus will sometimes come up, come to an academic conference and they will sit in the audience and then they will ask very sharp questions to the speaker and say, you assume this and you said this, but why do you speak like this? Mm-hmm. So you can do that. Mm-hmm. And it serves to, uh, you can say, um, you know, it's like, uh, 
it, it, it serves to activate the discussion, to raise the question, to push. Yes. But if you want to set the terms of the debate, then the best way to do it is to become an insider, where you yourself become trained in the, the, that field of knowledge, understand the terms of the discourse, and then enter it as an expert, as a peer, and say, I'm not satisfied with the terms of discussion here. I want to change the questions being asked, right? So the, the, you, if we, for example, we find more devotees, children, becoming scholars, becoming academics, we can change the terms of the discussion uh, in ways that are academically rigorous, and accepted by our peers, right? Because we are now one of them. We are part of them. We're never one of them in the sense that uh, we are always Vaishnavas. We're always devotees. I'll give you the example of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Sarvabhama Bhattacharya. For me personally, that Leela has been a great source of inspiration in my academic seva. Because notice what Mahaprabhu does. He comes there and he takes on a humble stance first. And he says, yes, you please teach me what is Vedanta. He listens for seven days continuously. And after he has done that, okay, put in his tapasya, then Sarva Bhama Bhattacharya says, you have something to say? And Mahaprabhu says, yeah, well, actually I have a lot to say. Uh, your whole discussion on Vedanta is very learned. But the terms of your discourse are not one that I accept. You're beginning from the assumption of impersonalism. And I don't accept that. Right? So for me, it was like in the academic world, not seven days, but seven years of listening humbly and taking in, taking in, taking in. And after you get your PhD, then finally someone will ask you, so you have something to say, Dr. Gupta? And you say, actually, I have a lot to say on this matter and you start publishing and you start speaking at conferences. And it's been my personal experience that just the presence of a devotee there, a scholar who's also a practitioner, changes the nature of the discourse. You, you don't even have to be speaking, just even in the audience. It changes the assumptions that it changes what the speakers can assume and what they are willing to just brush under the rug. They have to speak in a way that is appreciable to you, even in the audience. What to speak of you being on the panel itself and being one of the speakers. So it has a very powerful impact. And we see this in all fields. Devotees who have entered the field of book publishing, devotees who have entered the field of uh, therapy and psychology, devotees who have entered the field of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, engineering, devotees who have entered the field of medicine, right? Each one of them, in the course of time, they have served to change the very nature of the discourse, the very nature of the questions being asked. Uh, so this is a very, very powerful mechanism, not just shouting from the outside, but speaking from the inside, from a position of being a peer, uh, not a bystander, but a peer, uh, someone who is respected by them. And the more that we as Vaishnavas, and especially I mean the younger generation, Vaishnav children, are willing, and that means their parents, right, are willing to let them enter multiple fields and to be Vaishnavas in those fields, the more we will change the nature of the discourse in society and not simply be reactive to what's happening, but be actively, proactively part of shaping the way society looks, being a participant in that process and not just an observer. Beautifully put. Yeah, actually, I appreciate this point that uh, as devotees, the parallel between Sarvam Bhattacharya is hearing from him and uh, hearing in the academia. It's a very good example. And, uh, you know, we just as we wouldn't want an outsider to tell us what Bhagavad Gita means. In, so similarly, in the academy also, they don't want outsiders to tell what, what it means. So that, that makes sense. 
So, no, I think you also wanted to go to a bigger question. You said that the dating of the scripture is not as important as the <laughs> very fact that whether it is a revelation, whether it is it is coming from man or that it is actually coming from God. So yeah. That is, it is a very big question. How, how do you personally handle? How did you handle that? Yeah. So, so just one little thing before I go there, Prabhu, I wanted to say that uh, we are not Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So surviving seven, even seven days, what to speak of seven years, uh, while listening to Mayavada Bhashya or anything else uh, is a big question. It's a big challenge. And especially in the academic world, in this uh, dance of faith and reason, many, many persons have lost their faith in Srila Prabhupada and in Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's approach and so on. So we have to be very careful in doing this approach that I'm discussing of becoming the insider, uh, because uh, becoming the insider uh, doesn't mean that we lose our identity as Vaishnavas. That is always supreme. Right? That is always the Jivera Swarup Hoy Krishna Nitya Das. That is our Swarup. Uh, so uh, the, the becoming the insider doesn't mean that things become covered over so much that we forget that we are Krishna Das. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, in that factor, I, I have to say that the most important thing, the most important thing that if, from my experience to survive those seven days or seven years is uh, having Vaishnav Sangha and the association of devotees. And especially important, of course, the association of all devotees. But especially important is having the association of other devotees who are engaged in the same type of seva, of pursuit. Because together, when one person is feeling the pangs of doubt, another person is there to help support. And when they are feeling the pangs of doubt, you are there to help support. And so before embarking on any kind of seva, the first thing we have to ask ourselves is, is there a community of devotees with whom I can do it, who are pursuing the same type of seva with me? If the answer to that question is yes, then we should not be afraid to go in. We should stick closely to that uh, uh, sangha. And, and, and not just that sangha, but more broadly, we cannot uh, isolate ourselves to only one type of sangha. But that, that thing is often absent. You know, we're going to our local temple, we're doing arti and puja and kirtan, but we don't have anyone else who is pursuing religious studies with us, the situation can become frankly very, very difficult. Agreed. And this is back to my earliest point about the importance of the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies in my own life. Mm. That wasn't even so much the academic center, but the house that we were all renting together. That place was a sanctuary. Every morning, we would do morning program together and we would read Chaitanya Chaitamrita as part of our morning program. And it was the most amazing experience of reason wedded with faith in the context of other Vaishnavas who were working on the same pursuit, right? And I think that is what helped me uh, sustain my Krishna consciousness during that crucial period of, of the, the, those seven days, seven years. That is the most crucial period. Once you are passed and they allow you to speak, once once the conversation becomes a dialogue, then it's okay. It, it, it's, still, it's still a challenge, but it's not, it's not that much of a challenge. When you're new, when you first entered, when you just arrived, and you have to listen, 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 listen for seven years, that is when you need that sadhu. And so I just wanted to mention that one point to complete that Sarvabhoma example is that we cannot, we're not Mahaprabhu. So we cannot just dive in like the yeah. hero of the story. That's true. You know, one, of the, uh, one of the metaphors I like to use for this is it's a war. In one sense, it's an intellectual war, it's a war. Mm. And uh, in a war, the sincerity alone is not enough. You need competence, you need colleagues. So I might be on the side of virtue, but if I have a gun that is not firing and the other person has a machine gun, I'll be slaughtered. So if uh, and if I don't have colleagues who are watching my back, I might be attacked from elsewhere also. So in a sense, for somebody to enter into the academic fields, they also need to have a certain level of intellectual ability because logic, analysis, reasoning faculty, these are also skills. 
and sometimes skeptics or atheists they might be better at that than us their their conclusions um may be off but their expertise in arguing might be better than us and we can get bewildered so both i mean yes we need the association but just like in any service we need supportive association but we also need some innate ability if somebody wants to become a like a full time service as a kirtanier they need singing ability without that they they can they can do kirtan but they cannot become a kirtanier yes, so yes. similarly i think and, that intellectual competence is also required at a basic level and then of course yes. so, uh, this supportive association is so important because i feel although i did not ever enter into the field of academics but i do read widely and one thing is that unless we have a place where we can raise our questions and not be judged as faithless for raising those questions yes. then it, without without that space we will we will get we will feel choked internally yes that that is this is why that guhya makhyati prachati is so important because of that element of judgment that you mentioned that that space of faith without judgment uh that is that is really really powerful i mean if you find that in your krishna consciousness that is like magic in any kind of field in any service i i know you did not mean you did not mean to say this but i just want to clarify for the sake of our listeners that in the academic world we i mean my experience has it, it's been that if we think of it in an us versus them scenario it it is not very productive at all uh, and it is not reality uh, there yes there are those who are bhaktas and then there are those who are like richard dawkins mm-hmm. there's no question that there are people who are on that side and they get a lot of you know youtube notoriety and so on so that aspect is there but frankly uh, our time in the academic world is not spent very wisely dealing with the richard dawkins type uh, they true. have to have a certain flair for public performance in order to deal with him but our our work is is um we it's the partners that we are talking that that you had discussed you had just mentioned those partners can be found in the vaishnav community they can also be found more broadly outside the vaishnav community in the academic world we find people who are uh, people or persons of great faith who are on a shared uh uh, uh sense of mission and a shared sense of devotion is there also mm. you can people who are more skeptical but less some with less i mean there's all what i mean to say is that all shades are there of different types of individuals sometimes we have we think of the the academic or the scientific world in a monolithic way we demonize them they're all you know we have to just smash them and or, or other times we consider themselves them to be such every one of them is just angelic they're all you know a uh, perfect gyanis who know everything and we have to just mold our own identity based on what they are saying both of those perspectives are not at all fruitful uh we have to recognize that there's shades of different types of individual individuals all throughout the spectrum and some of my my most amazing mentors in the academic world who taught me how to balance this faith and reason together one was a shri vaishnav and the other uh, was a, a catholic right and so we uh, of course amongst the vaishnavas there were also but my point is that we can find that that sense of shared uh, mission and development and journey across the spectrum and so i just wanted to make make clear that yeah, we, we don't want to see it in a us versus them scenario yeah when i talked about the i agree with you this point that ultimately we are all on a shared journey the specifics of that where we are coming from and specifics of where we are going may vary but there is a sh- sense of shared journey when i talked about uh, it's a battle and competence and weapons my point was more about the fact that there are certain skills which are required for this service yes. and in that sense if somebody is going in a war field and they don't even know how to use a sword so then they are not going to be very successful there yes. and another way i think is that it's every serious discussion whether it is between two people or whether it is we when we are reading a book you know that discussion involves you could say almost like a 
reincarnation of ideas reincarnation of conceptions okay this was my understanding just like the soul leaves one body and gets a more evolved form so our one conception in a sense dies and it comes in a more evolved way so it's it's more metaphorical it's not literal that there is a war but it is it's a continuous so we have to have that ability to to deal with the ideas deal with the fact that our ideas will be challenged and when the ideas are challenged that can feel like a battle but through that challenge the ideas become more crystallized and then they Very come nice. forward in more evolved forms nicely put nicely put prabhu and i want to reaffirm what you said about our nature that we really have to act according to our nature and 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 we for i mean for myself i i recognized at some point that whether i liked it or not i would be doing this kind of thing right mm. so might do it in krishna service mm. <laughs> because i i can i can and 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 give myself the proper training and the tools and the association to do it well right so it's going to happen one way or the other like at that point you realize this is i'm incurable in this regard i i will and someone may may discover any situation i go into i'm going to manage that situation right this is this is my nature it's it's not going to there's not i'm incurable in this regard and so then you might as well give yourself the proper training and the skills and the association so that you you can do it well you you're going to do it anyway so you might as well learn how to do it well and for me that was a, a recognition that okay i need to get proper training in the academic world because you put me in the academic world or you don't i'm going to do this this type of intellectual type of analysis and work is just who i am i cannot help it so might as well figure learn how to do it well and and find a way to do it so it has the maximum impact in seva mm. so i think that's that's how we have to encourage the younger generation is to recognize and instead of saying no 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 this type of gyan devotees don't do or no 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 this type of you know you're by trying to boss everyone around you're being a you this is arrogance devotees don't do this instead of doing that we have to say no 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 this this you 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 have to do this let me show you how to do it properly here is the sangha here is the training mm. and here is the seva for you to do that's now of course this is all easier said than done but that's the ethos i think that we have to enter it with that's true you know i read about i find my primary inspiration or contribution in the writing i write more for a general audience than a academic audience but i was reading one book by a writer and he says that sometimes while writing you feel that nothing is coming through and i feel that i can't write so he says if you start feeling like that then stop writing go on with your life and if after a week a couple of weeks after a month you feel i can't live without writing <laughs> <laughs> then you will come back and then you won't be so obsessed with how quickly the result is coming how good the result is coming so in one sense when you talk about our swabhav our nature it it is there are many things to it but one thing one aspect is that you know, doing it is more important than enjoying the rewards of doing it so so for some people being intellectual is what they are going to be going mm. to study scripture is and they can't be without it as you said then better do it in a way that is constructive yes yeah. yes otherwise we get half baked knowledge you know and that becomes like the worst ever so <laughs> so you you end up doing it in an amateurish way and it can become dangerous to you and to everyone around you basically so amateurish in the sense that if you don't invest to get the necessary training and the skills to do it well then you'll do it in a and the association okay a gratefully so do we have the time to go into the revelation aspect yes uh, maybe we 10 15 minutes we could discuss and we'll see how it goes is that okay sure. yeah so going back to that you mean the point where i was saying that the historical aspect was actually an early question yeah. and not the most difficult one but then there were other more difficult questions yes right so so uh, yeah going back to that point 
Um, I think um, uh, the more challenging question is in terms of how uh, um, scholars and how we as devotees approach the subject of religion. Uh, uh, scholars, academics, uh, historians, they see religion as a human product born from certain historical, social, cultural contexts, right? mm. uh, produced by human beings in human society. And religious people all over the world, Vaishnavas, Christians, anyone, they see religion as being something that is consistent, comprehensive, and timeless. Okay? These three things are key, consistent, comprehensive, and timeless. Uh, what I mean to say by these three is that uh, first, starting with the last, timeless, that these are truths that are eternal. It's not like, you know, yesterday Krishna wasn't God until we all, he all emerged as a God in, in Hindu society. No, he's, God is God, right? So Krishna is always the Supreme Personality of God, to take a simple example. Uh, but truths are timeless, um, uh, that uh, they are, uh, our, our, our religion, our faith, our tradition provides a comprehensive view of reality, right? So we don't say uh, Krishna consciousness explains or describes this, but uh, when it comes to um, Japan, Krishna consciousness is irrelevant. It has nothing to offer. Uh, or when it comes to uh, uh, Japan or China, we have nothing to say. It's only relevant for India. Okay. Or it's, it's, it, was, it was a perspective that works now, but it didn't work 50 years ago. Or it, is, um, it explains um, the nature of God, but we have nothing to say about the nature of this world. No, religion is comprehensive. It's a, okay. it's a total system for understanding life, existence, experience, knowledge, everything, right? Human beings, animals, plants, the moon, the stars, everything is explained. Yeah. It's timeless, it's comprehensive, and we insist on consistency. That what we are, that what Krishna says at the beginning of Bhagavad Gita is consistent with what he says at the end of the Gita, right? Now, there are different things he says. One, he says, you know, you should fight because it's your honor and all of that, your kshatriya. And then he says, give up all dharmas. So we don't say, oh, Krishna is contradicting himself. We can't take him seriously. No, we say these two things fit together. One is your swadharma, one is parodharma. So we find ways of explaining it in a consistent fashion. True. So this is not just devotees. This is any person, I should say any theistic person at least, is, is concerned with these three items. Okay. Religious studies, on the other hand, uh, academia is specifically focused on those truths that are relative, that are contingent, that are changing over time. So when, I'll give you an example, when the devotee studies the Upanishads, they are looking for those eternal truths that the sages have spoken for thousands of years and are relevant to us today in our own lives. Mm -hmm. When the scholar is looking at the Upanishads, they are seeing that this Upanishad is a product of North Indian rivalries between kingdoms in the sixth century BC. And you find elements of that rivalry clearly visible in the debate that happens in the court of Janaka between Yagnyavalki and the other pla uh, places. Yagnyavalki is from the East and the others are coming from the West. And there's certain political trajectory that is happening. Hmm. Now that question that I can guarantee no Acharya has brought up in their commentary. It is not a concern of ours, right? Whether there's political rivalries and when they're located in history geographically between different kingdoms. Okay, I shouldn't say never. Maybe someone has brought it up. But that is not our primary concern. Right? Hmm. In fact, not only is it our, not our primary concern, but it can feel like a downright threat to our faith. Because we are now taking that which is eternal and comprehensive and consistent, and we are pointing out things that are temporal and limited, relative rather, and inconsistent or contradictory within it. In other words, we are taking that which is divine 
because that which is divine has these three characteristics, eternal, comprehensive, and timeless. And we are showing what is human within it. Because human beings are not consistent, they're not timeless, and they're not comprehensive. We're very limited and very, very relative and very temporary. So they're looking at the same object from different perspectives altogether. And this is the fundamental issue that causes religious people to see intellectual scholars with some measure of distaste, some measure of fear, and some measure of rejection. And this is what gets some scholars to see religion as religious people as being rather naive, mm. otherworldly. So this is the, the conflict set up between the two. And I have some suggestions, some reasons for why it doesn't necessarily have to be a conflict, that in fact, they can be quite useful to each other. Uh, but is, is so far, is that okay? Before I, I move any it's further. Clearly articulated. You know, I have heard different articulations of this and I also thought about it. <coughs> One articulation is that <coughs> when we look at tradition, when an uh, insider or a practitioner studies the tradition, their default attitude is faith. Whereas when a scholar, academic scholar studies it, the default attitude is questioning, is doubt. Hmm? Which is similar to what you're saying. But that's one way I'd heard of it. Another way I had thought of it is that basically the when the devotee is studying it, the focus is on, on developing a relationship with Krishna. I often talk about the difference between knowing Krishna and knowing about Krishna. So whereas the, so the academic scholars approach is to know about. So it's, it's like a doctor, say a child is sick and the child goes to a mm, child is taken to a doctor. Mm -hmm. Now the doctor knows more about the biological indicators of the child, much, much more than the mother. You know, how much is the blood count, RBC or platelet count or whatever. But it is the mother who knows the child better. Mm. So, the, so there is a knowing about and knowing. That was one difference. And then the challenge is, what, what do you do when the mother has to be the doctor? Mm. So in some ways, those who are trying to integrate the faith and the reason, it's like we want to, at one level, devote ourselves, love ourselves, love and offer ourselves to the object. But we, at the same time, we want to analyze and study and uh, uh, you could even scrutinize that object. Mm -hmm. So those are two metaphors, which I had, and there are several more I could give, but I like this articulation that comprehensive, consist, uh, comp consistent and timeless as compared to the human approach. Now, another metaphor that I heard about is that how <clears throat> basically, you know, earlier when you're talking about faith, I was thinking of the point of panentheism, how mm -hmm. God is nature and God is more than that. So similarly, in my understanding, uh, if we look at religion, yes, religion has a historical dimension to it. It has a social dimension to it. It has a cultural dimension to it. You could say it has a psychological dimension to it also. However, the problem is when we reduce religion to all this and there's nothing more to it. So but religion is all this and more. So for the insider, for the practitioner, the more is most important. And for the academic scholar, all this is most important. So in that sense, it's, a, it's not so much a, a intrinsic conflict as, a, as, a, as, a, as you could say, as a conflict of focus or as a divergent focuses. Yeah. I, I, this last point you made, Prabhu, I like very much. It's, it's very well put um, and because the, the academic perspective becomes its own worst enemy when it becomes reductive in relation to religion. It reduces religion to merely the social, merely the psychological, merely the political. Uh, and it is true that scholars are not interested in or equipped to understand the transcendent aspects of religion. 
And any honest scholar will say, not that my method uh, proves that there is no transcendent aspect. That is a non-scholarly position. That is a position of faith. If, if, you, if a scholar says there is no transcendent reality, then they're articulating a position of faith. Uh, uh, they're articulating I say, a religious position. That is a religious, atheism is a, is a religious position. Yes. It has certain convictions about the nature of God. So there, the, the methods of religious studies uh, allow you, like any scientific discipline, are limited exclusively to what can be perceived by the human senses. So you cannot disprove that something beyond the human senses does not exist. You cannot disprove that it does exist uh, because when all that you can perceive is only within the realm of the senses, right? So, so in sense you could say that, if, if I just understand this right, that yeah. it's more, if we reject the transcendent, then that is also like faith in faithlessness. Yes. Mm-hmm. So it's more of a position of say functional agnosticism. It might be there, it might not be there, but that's not, uh, that's not what our focus is. That's not what our scope of study is. It's something like that? Yes. An honest scholar, exactly. An honest scholar will say that, look, my ability to study and my interest lies within the human and material dimensions of religion. And the fact that there is or is not a God, there is or is not an afterlife, those things are for you to decide, O oh, religious person. Right? This is your, your, your area uh, of, of work. So, so s- properly speaking, scholarship does not uh, make a, a judgment on, on issues of transcendent reality. However, the, the problem becomes when you, things that are presumed by the uh, devotee to be transcendent are then explained in using historical uh, or social or political uh, forces, historical political context. When that happens, then say, say I believe that God gave a revelation to such and such person asking that this be done. And I show you that that change that happened in the tradition was a direct result of political forces and social forces that were prevalent in society at that time in history. Now, did it happen because of God or did it happen because of the forces of history? And this can be seem like a direct threat mm. to the religious person. I think that uh, Salman Rushdie's Satanic Verses is a classic mm-hmm. example of that, where Muhammad adjusted certain revelations and he said earlier the devil spoke and then, then he said, so I, don't, I want to reject that. But then he said that was more for accommodating. He initially wanted to accommodate the people over there and then he found that accommodating doesn't work. So he rejected those ideas. It's a big subject, but I think that's a, one example we could say of. Excellent. <clears throat> yeah. Yes. So, so this is true in, in every tradition that this challenge is there, right? And, and so it, it, it takes a lot of maturity and a lot of, um, shall I say, faith to be willing to risk studying and understanding what those uh, socio-political historical explanations are in relation to one's tradition, in relation to the transcendent aspects of one's faith. Because uh, uh, the natural tendency of a religious person is to explain everything in transcendent terms. This is Krishna's work. And the, the tendency of the scholar is to explain everything in historical, historically contingent terms. Uh, and, and so, the, the, the meeting of the two sides becomes a, a really great challenge. It, it, it's like I was saying, it was, it, it's set up for conflict, but it doesn't have to be that way. There can be a way to bring those perspectives together. And for that, let me give you a little example. Uh, someone presents you with a very uh, well, beautifully decorated cake to eat, right? So it's birthday or something like that. You, you get a cake. Now, there's two ways of appreciating that gift that you receive. One is to ask questions about it. Oh, really, how did you make this? What ingredients went into it? Um, that, those decorations, is it, what kind of icing is it? Is it, uh, you know, buttercream icing? Or is it cream cheese icing? Or is it fondant? Uh, 
and then uh, uh, and 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 where did you get the ingredients? And how long did it take to make? And the other option is to you cut a slice, sing happy birthday, cut a slice, and just eat it, and let the flavor give you the full experience of what that cake is. Mm-hmm. Anyone who hears this, so a devotee is going to say, of course, the flavor of the cake. That's when you really know. Otherwise, it's licking the the bottle of honey on the outside, right? And the scholar is going to say, if you're too so busy licking the plate clean, how can you ever understand anything about what you're eating? Which is also a fact. Right? If you're eating, enjoying that cake, are you actually concerned with questions about ingredients, etc.? No, you've already made a decision to dive into it. You've committed to it, right? So you're going to be concerned about the flavor. So, but the point is, both perspectives are crucial, right? If you want to know something, as you put it so nicely beforehand, you can know it by experiencing it, by committing to it. Right? You put the cake in the mouth, you have committed to it. Whatever the ingredients are, they are inside you. Right? You've made a commitment to that. So that's, that's a very powerful way of experiencing it. And the, and the person making the cake analysis can never appreciate fully what the cake is without tasting. But on the other hand, the person who is eating the cake when something is this close to you, you also are uh, blind to certain aspects of that, uh, that thing that you're eating. How you, you cannot see context, you cannot see history, you cannot see politics, you cannot see sociology, you cannot see so many of the contingent factors that went into your experience because you are this close to it. For that, you need some distance to understand those aspects. So my point is certain things are understood up close and certain things are best understood from a distance. And both of those perspectives are essential if we want a complete understanding of what it is that we want to study, what it is that we love. And so while our preference may be up close, Mm. we should recognize the value in seeing something from a distance. Both sides, the academic and the intellectual uh, and the devotional can temper each other's weaknesses. They can support the weaknesses. The weakness of the academic side is that they can reduce religion, as you were saying earlier, and miss the very reason why religion is such a powerful force in the world. If you look at it only from historical, political, sociological perspective, you, you will scratch your head wondering, why is it that religion still exists, even in this age of science and reason? Right? You, you cannot make heads or tails of what, why is religion such a powerful force and why it's such a beautiful force and why it's so effective to bring about change in people's lives and in society. You will miss all of that if you, all, if you reduce religion just to the political and social. So for the, relig- for the scholar, taking advantage of the religious person's experience of eating the cake up close is essential in order to not fall into the trap of reducing religion. But on the other hand, for the devotee, for the devotional person, it is also essential to avoid the weakness of the religious position, which is this, that religious positions can become absolutist, they can become insular. Because we believe in an absolute truth, which we can never give up, that belief in an absolute truth can lead to absolutism. It should not, but it can. The sense that I am better than everyone, I have figured everything out, right? And I, everyone else in my path is wrong. They are worthy of destruction. I do not need any contact with the rest of the world. And that type of insular thinking, which leads to religious conflicts and war and violence and bigotry, that can be tempered. It can be softened when we train ourselves to take some distance and to recognize that, yes, my own religion has changed over time. It has absolute truth. There's no question. But that absolute truth has been applied differently over time in different places in different circumstances. That there are, yes, everyone is acting with bhakti, but sometimes also there can be political considerations that go into how religion is run and how it is practiced and how it is moved in the world, right? That there can be some 
less lofty effects, uh, reasons for religion's work in the world, and that we don't have to wait until after the damage has been done to recognize that in, in hindsight, but that we can actively learn to see things from a distance also. So both have their strengths and both have their weaknesses, the insider and the outsider, the academic and the, and the scholar and, and the devotee. And both can take advantage of the other's strengths in order to help themselves. They will never leave their positions, but they can benefit from the other. And that dialogue is what is so crucial for us today in the contemporary world, where we see both examples of scholarship that is dismissive of religion and gives pain to religious people, and we see examples of religious bigotry and hatred that are born from this insular perspective on religion. So that dialogue is so crucial for our world today to have that. And we should not be afraid of it. That dialogue is difficult. Sometimes it's quite painful, but it is very useful. And when done in the proper guidance and proper context and association can be very, very beneficial for us. That's beautiful, Ro. How both can help each other. I was thinking of some examples over here, but before I go into that, say if we look at, uh, say let's take Prabhupada's example. You know, Prabhupada went to America and he was spectacularly successful. So we can say this is, this is Krishna's arrangement. It is Prabhupada's purity, Krishna's empowerment by which he was successful. So that is the transcendental aspect. Now we could also look at the socio-cultural aspects of America. And there was a counterculture at that time. And that counterculture, at one, se one sense, people were very skeptical about established religion and established systems of knowledge and everything. But they were also receptive to Eastern spirituality. So one example that I used to reconcile this is that that uh, it Prabhupada, that Krishna set the stage for Prabhupada through all these situations. And, but even if there is a beautiful stage, it is the dancer has to dance expertly. So if we consider it only as transcendental empowerment, then that is functioning in this world. So we could say that there was so much time Prabhupada was trying in India. India, there are not so many results. So we could say, okay, that is Krishna's plan. But I find that once we start, I like that point, especially I think we can hold on to an absolute truth without needing to hold on to absolutism. Mm -hmm. That, yes, there, there is a spiritual explanation for things, but that doesn't mean we cannot look for sociological or cultural or other factors, other factors that also matter. So, you know, India was not receptive at that time. So it was not that uh, Prabhupada was empowered when he went to America and he was not empowered when he was in India. But for, even for empowerment to work, some, certain circumstances are important. So looking at the sociological factors does not decrease the glory of Srila Prabhupada. Yes. At the same time, if we say that sociological factors alone were success, made the success, ah. then that is also a problem. So it's the, we, in some ways, the transcendental and if I may use the word circumstantial, mm -hmm. the transcendental circumstantial both can work together. Now the yeah. conflict may come where does the domain of the transcendental end and where does the domain of circumstantial begin? And we may not even need to do that hair splitting analysis most of the times. Sometimes we may need to, but <coughs> so this was one thought I had uh, and I had one more point, but do you want to speak? Something? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so where one begins and the other ends, uh, let me propose that, that they're, that they're, they're, completely overlapping in, 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 their, in their domains, that it's not separate domains, but overlapping domains. In other words, it was definitely Krishna's will, Krishna's empowerment, his will that Prabhupada succeed in America. Mm -hmm. But is it possible that Krishna's will could be manifest through uh, uh, arranging society, creating the proper circumstances in just the right historical, sending Prabhupada at just the right moment, historically, to do this work? Is it not possible, in other words, that Krishna's will can be manifest through society, through
through politics, through timing, through history? Of course it can, right? Krishna is controlling everything. So who is to say that his will is opposed when we create this false dichotomy, right? This versus this. Then we're forced to choose. Was it this or was it this? And what if these things are the same? What if Krishna's will is sometimes manifest with him descending on the back of Garuda through a parting in the skies? And other times it's manifest in more simple ways through uh, by sending George Harrison to Srila Prabhupada, by creating just the right visa situation in the United States mm. to allow immigrants. I remember Brahmananda Maharaj, Brahmananda Prabhu wrote a, um, a very nice article in Journal of Vaishnav Studies describing the specific uh, legal and political situation that made Prabhupada's arrival in America so perfect, right? Yeah. So well-timed. So that timing is Krishna's hand. Now, these two things, we can see it from transcendent or we can see it from material, but they are not different. They don't have to be a dichotomy. And look at the advantage of seeing it from both perspectives. When we see it, that this is Krishna's will, that makes us um, appreciate Krishna's power and his ability to do anything and everything for his devotee, right? That the importance of surrender to Krishna in the way that Srila Prabhupada demonstrated. When we see the historical circumstances, what does it teach us? That we have to be aware of, just like Prabhupada was, we have to be aware of what is the social, cultural, political environment around us and connect to that if we want to give Krishna consciousness. And so if we then we, we look at Prabhupada's circumstance, we can say, now what is the situation in my time in the United States? Okay, counterculture is not such a big thing anymore, but this is the area where it's really developing. Yoga is an amazingly mainstream thing and powerful thing. So this is one area where I can connect. Mm. Here's interest in Bhagavad Gita has skyrocketed since Prabhupada's time. Uh, in, in many ways because of Srila Prabhupada himself. Yeah. So this is a way I can connect, right? So that awareness then, if I say, no, 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 it's all Krishna's will, I will just go on doing what I'm doing. I close my eyes and then that is, that is we're losing something. Right? We are losing something by closing our, our eyes to the circumstantial, to the contextual, to the contingent. So there is great benefit in seeing the same story from two different perspectives. Both of them can work together to help our Krishna consciousness. Beautiful. So, so rather than one, both of them, as you said, overlapping and both work in parallel. And we could say both are the working of Krishna only. One yes. is Krishna working, uh, working, as you said, breaking through the principle of history and the laws of nature and yes. doing something miraculous. And other is Krishna working through the working of historical yes. circumstances, yes. both ways. Yes. So in a sense, he can go against, he can, he can work through yes. both Krishna has both options, right? So they're overlapping, but for us, ultimately the Krishna narrative has to be overarching. Remember that's comprehensive. Mm-hmm. consistent and timely. So that has to overcome everything. So I prefer to see them not as somehow there's Krishna and then there's the force of history and the two opposing forces are fighting each other or in my own mind, but rather say, no, Krishna is encompassing everything. He is the eternal and he is also the temporal. He's acting. He's, as you said so nicely, he's cutting through the force of history and showing I don't have to work through history. I can do magic. And Prabhupada's story was a story of magic. Prabhupada in many ways, he defeated all expectations that are reasonable socially, historically, politically. His, his results were completely unreasonable, right? They were completely illogical in the sense of beyond logic, right? Mm-hmm. And no one can expect that kind of result. You can do everything Prabhupada did, you won't get that kind of result in just the right circumstance. Because it's not. Krishna cut through history and decided, I want to show my own power here. But also... Krishna works within history. He works within culture and within politics and society. And that aspect was also clear in Prabhupada's story. So I I very much like these two things you said, cutting through and working within. Krishna, all of it, the whole story is Krishna only. Mm. That's true. So this, when you talk about this, say the devotional approach and the academic approach, 
Now there is something in between which is devotional scholarship within the tradition itself. So uh, the tradition you could I could call it simply as traditional scholarship as contrasted with academic scholarship. So the traditional scholarship also at least in India we had a rich tradition of intellectual debate. So I presume there was a certain amount of criticality and a certain amount of uh, intellectual rigor there also. So is it that that is that was lost over time or is it that because that was more insular so that has lost relevance now no it's it's not lost relevance and it's not been lost over time sometimes it becomes overshadowed by voices that are more absolutist or fundamentalist in perspective but it is never lost if that is lost in the tradition then the tradition itself dies essentially if we lose the ability to question ourselves and to think critically through what we're studying now the 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 difference is simply that when we do it when the acharyas do it they always begin from a position of faith of conviction in the transcendence and the beauty and the perfection of what they are studying this is in in christian theology this is called faith seeking understanding right that you you start with faith and you seek understanding but the questioning aspect never goes away right and i'll give you one little example um one of the the one of the the pillars of uh, academic scholarship in regards to texts today is is uh, critical textual scholarship is called com- creating critical editions where you compare different mm. manuscripts of the same edition and you look for changes uh, differences between them and you try to decide to the best of your ability which is likely to be the original version every text will have those slight variations most of them are unconscious unconsequential in nature but some can become important there's a difference in meaning or something mm-hmm. now this is this is the this is like one of the uh, pinnacles of western textual scholarship the ability to do this uh, but we find that the acharyas in their commentaries on bhagavatam they are um uh very uh, frequently pointing out uh, uh pathantara or partha bheda right different readings and they'll this one and this one and they'll explain both without uh, without actually trying to reach a judgment as to which one is better which one is right or which one is wrong they say whether you take it like this you take it like this here's the explanation for the first here's the explanation for the second both explain something very nice so it is not that the the acharyas the ancient mind was was blind to the fact that human uh human beings can in- introduce variations within a text right that's that's a human contingent relative reality that impinges upon the transcendent text the eternal text the eternal shastra they were not blind to the fact that human beings can have a temporary impact on that which is eternal they were aware of it in fact uh, uh rama uh, madhvacharya pointed out very clearly that many sections of the mahabharata cannot be trusted because there are so many variations in the text in different editions of it right so certain types of readings also uh, were um questioned or uh, were of matter of concern to acharyas not that simply all were accepted so the critical mind is all there and must be there is just that we have to allow that side of the tradition to flourish even to nourish it so that we have a place of faith seeking understanding not that we come to it from a place of faithlessness that that is for other people to do no for us we begin with a place of faith but we never turn the questioning business off otherwise the tradition will gradually die it will shrivel up it will lose its relevance and its robustness and gradually die and become just a shell only uh, of of this blind conviction mm-hmm. and faith yes that's so true so <clears throat> but it does seem to some extent at least that right now within hinduism or vaishnavism we don't have many forums or we could say insider scholarship in a way that can engage with the contemporary world we can have insider scholarship which 
say translates um, trans which translates the sacred texts into english and other things but actually to engage with the contemporary world we need to study the tradition deeply we also need to study the contemporary world deeply and in some ways maybe this is because i don't know various factors one is that india itself was under foreign rule and then india the whole idea of religious studies has not developed in india much and uh, we could go into that but this is i don't think this is just a issue with say iskon itself it's broadly with hindu scholarship i don't see a lot of uh, hindu teachers seriously engaging with contemporary thought now if i look at christianity you know there are so many conservative blogs liberal blogs and there's so many people who write and of course people write scholarly books also dealing seriously with contemporary issues so what do you feel about this yeah i mean what you pointed out prabhu is so so essential it's so important and very well stated that this is something that is lacking in in hinduism broadly in vaishnavism broadly in iskon specifically is both types of scholarship are so important the the internal scholarship where we are doing our the study of our shastras and and having internal debates about the meanings of particular verses and so on and so forth and and how we should practice but then also um uh, uh those that engage with the broader world with the outside world right so on the one hand we have the shastrik advisory council which you and i both serve on in some capacity right and this is so crucial for the institution to resolve questions for the tradition to resolve questions through insider scholarship using our pramanas and 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 not necessarily looking outside we may look once in a while but not that's not the foundation of what we do so this is essential but the other aspect of it is also so crucial that we want scholars uh, we want thoughtful devotees who engage with the contemporary discourse dialogues issues of our time Mm-hmm. and I, i mean considering the size of the hindu community considering how accomplished we are in every field it is actually a great embarrassment to see how little we have to say on any of these issues i mean just think about any seriously done theology of the environment this is one of the biggest questions that faces the world today politically socially culturally in so many ways scientifically Uh, and yet yes there are 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 ecological statements out there you know we we love the environment we believe all human beings are are sacred all life is sacred those things are there and they're not bad but someone who has seriously engaged with all the implications of a theology there are very very few persons i mean literally you can count them on your fingers for a tradition that is over a billion people in terms of size think about hindu serious hindu ethics written on issues like like a uh, uh, bioethics for example on when i have to suggest when people ask me for readings my whole reading list all involves christian authors and jewish authors and muslim authors but when it comes to hindu sources you have an article here in some popular newspaper an article there maybe a short few words in this way that way but no one who has worked i shouldn't say no one very few who have worked by engaging with the contemporary discourse and but I, what i mean to say is not just here's what i think take it or leave it not that approach i mean i'm going to read seriously what my christian brothers and sisters have said i'm going to read seriously what the scientists have said on the issue of environment i'm going to read seriously on 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 what muslims have said i'm going to read seriously on what secular humanists have said and then i'm going to engage in a in a discussion that is already happening and i'm going to show how the vaishnavas how shri chaitanya mahaprabhu's movement has something clear and useful to contribute to that discussion that can help in uh, change the nature of the world right that is the outsider facing scholarship is very few and far between amongst hindus amongst vaishnavas among iskon and so rather than creating taking on a a, a fighting stance with sometimes you know as devotees we can take on a fighting stance or oh, these are these are a threat these scholars intellectuals historians they are a threat 
instead we should we should include them in the sense of having our own department our own field where we cultivate it right in the way that we want it in the way that is appropriate for us look at the catholic church there are pontifical universities where yes there are scholars who criticize the church and so on both outside and within but instead of just standing on the outside i was saying earlier and shouting and screaming that why do you say this about us better to have your own pontifical university where both the support is coming from people who are in a position of faith and commitment and also the criticism is coming from persons who you can trust as position of faith and mm-hmm. and and commitment to the tradition right that is so important that is something we want that we want a, our own institution of learning and our own community of scholars who can provide support when needed but also healthy criticism when needed that's true. and 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 in this way we 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 reduce some of the us and then them dynamic you know that you you are the the enemy and we have to protect ourselves from all of you scholars yeah. that is not deep i think one reason for that is you put it very well that it is lacking one reason is also at least for iscon often our purpose of engagement is conversion it's not discussion as you said that we want to enter into a discussion and show how we also have a valuable take on the discussion but often the purpose is you know we have the ultimate answer and our purpose is to convert and where we don't have much opportunity to convert people to our way of thinking often we think that there's not much much utility in engaging in that discussion also so in one sense there is a you could say there is a missionary organization which focuses on proselytization these are all words with negative connotations but that's the purpose but then there has to be a separate wing of it the purpose is not so much you know for many even for uh, in a proselytizing organization for many people philosophy is simply a tool for conversion it is not a it is not a, as you said faith seeking understanding it is more like analysis for conversion so then <clears throat> then i think that kind of scholarship doesn't get uh that that kind of attitude doesn't sustain scholarship so i think gradually our movement is creating space for that kind of scholarship just yesterday i had a discussion yes. with gorang prabhu and he was talking about the brc and the oxford mm-hmm. center is there so slowly i think we are creating pockets like that and in some ways it might be natural you know from the first generation we we didn't have the time or the bandwidth to focus on these things as our movement becomes stabilized then these things this kind of broader engagement with society it will take some time for it to happen isn't it yes it will take for some time for it to happen bro and that therefore also it's very difficult it takes a lot of vision to invest in cultivating this because the results show up not in 5 years not in 10 years not in 20 years they show up in the space of 50 60 70 sometimes 100 years you look at the great centers of learning in india or anywhere in the world they were never ever established and flourished in 5 years 10 years 15 years investment in this kind of learning and education and cultivation of a culture is not when i i think you described it very well that when it is instrumentalized it will not have its effect right my scholarship is an it's just an instrument in order to convert x is just an instrument in order to put out a press release it is only instrument to do this mm-hmm. uh, it's an instrument so that when i give, go out to give lectures at bhakti vikshas people will listen to me nicely they'll respect me that is why a phd is useful all of this is instrumentalizing education for its use in other goals and for that you will never re- reap the full benefits the full potential of what education is meant for right education has value that cannot be calculated in uh, in in short uh, goal oriented sort of approach it has to, one needs a very broad long term vision it's like planting an almond tree you plant it for your grandchildren to harvest the fruits right and and i think that that is as you said it's very natural that it develops in a tradition over time 
Even Prabhu, I wanted to say on the missionary work, this is a whole separate topic, but it is also uh, a, a, um, a, a, we do harm to our missionary work also when we perceive it in, in the ways that you describe. That actually mission and dialogue are not opposite ends of the same spectrum, right? It's not conversion versus dialogue. When we think of mission as opposed to dialogue, then actually it harms our mission itself, that it's not, it makes our mission less effective. Because going back to the very first place that we started this discussion, when we teach, and mission is teaching, that is the heart of mission. When we teach, we always begin from where the person we are teaching is at. And that requires genuine dialogue and understanding. I must hear from you in order to know where you're at. That's the foundation of dialogue. And that is the foundation of mission also, is dialogue and understanding. Mission is not opposed to dialogue. And it is an immature understanding of mission when we think of it as opposed to dialogue and discussion. We think of it in terms of conversion. That idea of conversion, honestly speaking, in that limited sense is something that is foreign to our tradition. It's foreign to our sampradaya. We have never thought of mission in those terms. Mission is bringing a person by mind and by heart to a different place. And any movement in that direction is success, right? It's not an on and off switch. The, the problem with the word conversion is that it suggests an on off switch, converted, blooped, converted, blooped, right? Like it's a light switch, <laughs> but this is not the case, right? A conversion is, is that mission is a, is a process. It's a journey of bringing people moving them towards Krishna. And the best way to start that journey and, and, and to pursue that journey is by beginning from where that person is at. And that is what is the definition of dialogue. Hearing and speaking. Hearing and speaking. Beautiful. So when we define mission in the, in the narrow term of, as you said, converting people, then then we are actually, like we say, scholars might have a reductionistic attitude toward religion. We can have a reductionistic attitude toward the whole process of elevating people's consciousness. Exactly. Yeah. And that is when I think when we try to go into conversion, then the we they hostility becomes more. And mm. then it is this idea of dialogue with the world is itself sometimes, uh, at least for me, it took many years to appreciate that this is what we are also meant to do. It is more like we are meant to talk, not even talk with the world. It is talk to the world. Mm. So that is often the idea of preaching. And then scholarship itself is quite antithetical to that. Because scholarship involves the give and take of ideas. Yeah. So, you know, this uh, maybe one or two last points, because I don't want to take you too much, take too much of your time. Mm -hmm. And I would love to have you again for a future discussion. But going back to the point of revelation, so in an academic sense, there is no way, am I right to say that there is no way to actually prove the reality of revelation, but then there is no way to disprove the reality of revelation also. So revelation is more a matter of faith that develops through what we discussed earlier, the various things. And those other components, one's engagement, one's personal experience, one's study of scripture, one's association and all those things. So it is through those things itself. So revelation itself uh, cannot be rationally proven. And I think that is where if you want to say talk about the faith and reason, I often in my classes, I give a metaphor that often in Christianity, they talk about the leap of faith. Mm -hmm. So I say that if this is one mountain, that is another mountain. It's not that this is the mountain of reason, this is the mountain of faith. Rather, from the mountain of faith also, you can have a bridge of reason. But the bridge of reason won't take you all the way to the mountain of faith. Mm -hmm. So in the, in, the sense, the bridge of reason takes you to some extent. So faith does not contradict reason. <coughs> faith, in a sense, supersedes reason. It goes where reason is going, but it goes further than that. How would you... What are your thoughts about this? Yeah, so Prabhu, just one thing on the, on the question of 
um, <coughs> uh, faith is, I, I forget the wording exactly that you used. Maybe you can correct me, but yeah. about rationality, you said the, the word rationality. I, I would not say that faith is different or beyond rationality because rationality is a very important component of faith. I mean, if you see Madhya Madhikari uh, is someone who is able to understand their faith through the scriptures, through reason, and to convince others about it also, right? Or is it, I'm getting confused, maybe. Correct, correct, yeah. No, yeah. so my point was that reason so, can, reason uh, can definitely, reason needs to be used to uh, explain faith, to understand faith, but faith itself is more than reason. We cannot, so for example, by reason I can talk about maybe how there is a God who, there is a divine being. But purely by reason, I cannot say that that divine being is a bluish black cowherd boy who plays a peacock, who plays a flute and wears a peacock feather. So, no. so by reason, I can understand and explain why the Bhagavatam is is a credible source of revelation. And within the Bhagavatam's revelation, there is, there is the description of Krishna that is given. So in that sense, so it's not, again, I like you talk, it's not irrational or non-rational. It's rational and then transrational. Yes. So we definitely need to use reason, but reason alone will not be, not take us all the way along the journey. Yes, yes. And 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 the, Prabhu, therefore, I I I I worry a little bit about the metaphor of the mountains because to me it creates too much of a separation between faith and reason. And it, it in terms of image, it assumes that one must leave one to come to the other, or leave one to or or, or and so there is there is separation and there is opposition. And as I was saying earlier, for me there's a much greater sense of overlap between the various mm. uh, aspects that faith is more than reason because it includes reason within it. Uh, I, I, I don't think a devotee ever leaves reason behind. It's jnana karma dhyanavritam. It is, bhakti is not covered. It's anavritam. It's not covered by reason. It doesn't mean that at any point bhakti becomes unreasonable, that it is lost uh, all together. And so that, that conviction that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of God and we are his servants, even to that point, there's, there's the element of reason is always there. But as you're saying, it is insufficient because reason is just one component of faith. And there is so much more uh, to faith than that. So maybe we think of it more in terms of Venn diagrams, diagrams might, yeah. I don't know, just off the top of my head that there's different realms, right? And there are those who are, if we have the circle of reason and we have the circle of, you know, uh, uh, pure conviction or faith, we can call it, or I don't, not, not faith, but, but your belief, let's say belief. And then we have another circle of, of experience and we have another circle of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, tra uh, the, the, the Shabda Pramana or whatever. So we have these different areas, right? And there are those who are on the extremes, uh, who are on the extreme of the circle of reason. Yeah, I'm not going to take faith in anything. I'm not going to trust anything. Only what my mind can figure out. Or in the realm of experience, only what I can experience with my senses, that is the only thing that is true. Mm. Or, you know, certain traditions say, certain religious traditions, my own experience is supreme. What I experience, that is true, right? So for a Vaishnava, the extremes of those circles are, are not a happy place. We want to be in a place where all of these overlap. Uh, and, and that space of overlap, that is where Krishna resides, right? Where there's reason, where there is trust in the Acharyas, where there is a sense of personal experience also. All of these are. Yeah, see, I agree with you fully this metaphor. See, any metaphor ultimately is inadequate. But yeah. when I use the metaphor of, say, mountain of reason, mountain of faith, my point was that see, for at some stages in our life, reason may be the sole basis of our faith. Mm? And that is good as a starting point. But sooner or later, we will experience some things which, which you can't figure out through reason. Mm -hmm. Then we move forward 
and then reason is one basis of our faith mm. so reason is not the sole basis but one basis and then i remember i read an article of uh, ravindra swarup prabhu where he talks about how you know he had read many art- arguments about the non existence of god and then somebody sent him that an article about uh, i mean a new theory about god's non existence mm. and he said that eventually when i read these arguments i found that my faith resisted all those arguments it was not that i could ra- make a rational case for the existence of god i just knew that god existed mm. so in a sense at that stage uh, it is not that a person has become irrational but that reason is not required for one's own faith so it is not that the, the person can still make very good reason very good arguments using reason but my point is that there is a certain level of experience which can give a deep conviction that transcends reason so in that sense we could if I, if if i say this is the mountain one mountain is reason one mountain is faith so we could say human consciousness like encompasses both mm-hmm. but it could be centered more on reason it could be centered partially on reason and it could be maybe faith is not the best word as a realization conviction experience whatever is the word you want to say so <clears throat> just like at uh, we say that madhavendra puri says that you know i no longer want to do my sandhya vandan because i am simply absorbed in krishna so uddhav gita also says that the gyani has to give up gyan to become fully absorbed in bhakti to offer himself to krishna so now giving up gyan is not rejecting gyan it is it is like giving up dependence on gyan yeah so re- there comes a stage so sole reliance on reason partial reliance on reason and no reliance on reason so no reliance on reason is not irrational it is transrational that's what i was trying to talk about by this this metaphor no that that makes it very clear thank you prabhu because that that was my concern is sometimes uh, that can lead to a slippery slope if we're not clear about that that people think or oh, religious faith means irrationality mm-hmm. and science rationality but uh, r- rationality is present in both the 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 question is what is the foundation of that rationality right and what is its goal the rationality is is merely a a mode of thinking and why should we give up any mode of thinking the question is what is the foundation of that rationality is it shabda praman or is it your own sense experience is the foundation and what is its goal is your goal to understand the nature of human beings and 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 the world or is your goal to understand krishna right so and and in each case the rationality has a different role to play so sometimes people i mean it is clear you are not saying this but sometimes people will speak of religion as as uh, as different from rationality as if religion is irrational but i remember uh, going to your point about ravindra sur prabhu how one time i was reading the commentary of ramanuja acharya on shri bhashya uh, his commentary on on vedanta sutra called shri bhashya hmm. he gave a wonderful argument for the existence of god and i was so happy reading it and then he proceeded to destroy the argument yeah all that section that's amazing yeah all to prove that tarko pratishthana that the lord is not establishable purely on the basis of logic but what was interesting is that to show that the lord was not provable by logic by tarka he was using logic alone right he was using logical thinking to prove that okay in other words logic rationality is a tool and a devotee is happy to use it when it becomes useful in krishna's service and happy to leave it behind when it is simply an impediment in krishna's service so so in that way we are we are neither rationalists nor irrationalists rationality we accept and we say yukta vairagya it's useful for krishna's service i will use it but my identity my the basis of my faith is not exclusively on reason my identity is krishna das my faith is much broader than just mere reason and but when it is useful i am happy to use it just like that devotee in uh, the the uh, shakshi gopa story right he reasons with krishna if you can talk you can walk right now this is using simple logic mm. but is that, that that rationality that logic was useful and krishna was very pleased by it it was very sweet for krishna ah good point 
Nice point you're making. Right? It's a logical point. Yeah. Even we don't leave. We're talking with Krishna. We log- rationality may be useful, but it is a tool for the devotee. Never the goal. Never the object. Jnana karma adhyana. Yeah. Beautifully put. So when you talk about rationality, the foundation, by foundation, what you mean is that say empirical, because I see and I see the world, observe the world around me and I think maybe the world is rational. There is a rational order in the world. Let me figure it out. So in one sense, empirical observation is the basis of my rationality or I understand that there is a divine source to the world. And the divine source has permeated the world with the, with rationality. So in that sense, my, the foundation of my rationality is itself uh, is, is, is Krishna and the goal is also Krishna or yes. it is that the foundation is the world and the goal is also the world. Yes. Okay. Yes. Beautifully put because every rationality has to begin with certain axiomatic truths that are, cannot be proven through logic and any before applying reason, you have to begin someplace. Reason has to stand on something. Yeah. And what it stands on is our axiomatic truths that cannot be proven. Just like my Guru Maharaj, Hanumat Preshak Swami, he gives a very nice example of Euclid's geometry. Mm-hmm. And the, if you study U, uh, Euclid's geometry, there are certain axioms that it begins with, right? That the, the okay, what is a line? Now we can understand the line through logic. The shortest distance between two points is a line. Mm. Again, this is this is logic, but you can then push further and say, what is a point? And a point is defined as something with no length, no width, no height, and no mass. Mm. Now that is essentially, therefore, illogical. It is beyond rationality. The point, because there is nothing. There is nothing that it is beyond the senses. There is nothing that you can see, smell, touch, hear, taste. You, your mind cannot even conceive of anything. In your mind, think of a point. But what you have thought of has some length, it has some width, it has some shape. It, it probably even has a color to it. Mm-hmm. But Euclid is defining it as something that is different from all of that, right? Mm-hmm. It's based on how, how the Advaitins describe Brahman. Neti, 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 neti. As the starting point. Now, that is an axiom. How do you know that the point is right? That, that there is such a thing as a point. Those axioms of Euclid's geometry, the only way you know they are true is that they feel right. right? And feeling means rasa. Something in us tells us ah, that feels right to, to define a point like that. There is no instrument in the world, no rationality that can explain it. But it feels right. And so ultimately, as you're saying so nicely, that the foundation has of rational, rationality is a tool. You have to ask yourself, what is the foundation of my rationality? Mm. What is, and that foundation will always be based on feeling. It will always be based on, on rasa, on bhakti, on shraddha, on trust. It will be based on something that is transrational, that is beyond rationality. And for us, what feels right are certain axiomatic truths, namely that the world is a personal place. God is a person, we are personal, and everything around us is personal and relatable. relatable. This is an axiomatic understanding of the way that rasa works, that our world works. The scientific perspective may begin with a certain set of axioms, that the only things that are worth studying or perceiving or, or in understanding are those things that can be perceived by the five senses, right? So everyone begins from some place that is unprovable and is heading towards some place that is unprovable. Rationality is a useful tool in between, but it doesn't define either the beginning point or the end. point. Excellent. So beginning from the unprovable, going to the unprovable. Yeah. I think God's incompleteness theorem is also something similar that Every system of knowledge requires some propositions that cannot be proven by that system of knowledge that exists outside the system. I'm, I'm paraphrasing it. Yeah, that's true. So now this, I'm, not, I'm intrigued by your, your in that sense of feeling is rasa. That's interesting because even Einstein has famously said that 
that the intuitive mind is superior to the rational mind and most scientific advancements also happen primarily through intuition and this is how it is you can call it intuition you can call it inspiration but it's not just reason so in a sense you get the sense that this is right and then gradually through reasoning we come to think yeah maybe this maybe this is how it is right yeah so yeah that's so for us the the we accept that reason works because krishna has permeated the world with reason and then we use reason to go toward krishna and uh, it's uh, it's you earlier said this point that rationality is one mode of thinking it's we don't have to give it up but we don't have to make it the sole mode of thinking also so some for some devotees when krishna says man mana bhava now for some devotees that remembrance of krishna could be through reason and for some devotees it could be through spontaneous attraction and more of a personal connect, personal remembrance but it could be a tool for not just understanding the philosophy of krishna consciousness the krishna tattva but it could also be a tool for focusing the mind on krishna also yes 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 and and to, to the origin, to the beginning point of how it's so important to cultivate those various aspects right that we don't become lopsided otherwise it it can become a dangerous situation in our krishna consciousness in the long term if we're too lopsided on one side that we have to first of all recognize our nature and 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 our proclivity and nourish that proclivity through as we were saying proper training and proper association right so that we do it well if if that's reason is the side that really then we have to learn how to do it well in proper association proper guidance proper direction training but at the same time once we recognize it we have to actively make sure we don't become lopsided on the other side right mm-hmm. that it doesn't become the case that now i cannot sit in the bhagavatam class if any devotee except for a sanskrit scholar because otherwise ugh, it's too irrational the whole thing it's it's not it's not at the intellectual level that i appreciate no then we know that okay something is uh risky here something is off in our krishna consciousness if we cannot even appreciate the bhakti of another devotee because that bhakti is expressed using a different language a different set of tools than i am expressing it with mm. yeah so we don't want to become unidimensional we yes. we will have say one mode of connection with krishna as primary but we cannot not appreciate other modes of connection with krishna also true i think that's one of the one of the pitfalls in scholarship that instead of seeing scholarship or the intellectual way as one way of connecting with krishna we can start seeing it as the superior way of connecting with krishna yes and then that 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 can lead to judgmentality and that can lead to problems it is just one way to serve krishna and as soon as we start to think it is the best way to serve krishna then we know our own krishna consciousness is in risk and so it ultimately comes down to that fundamental principle of vaishnavism right of humility that ultimately the foundation of everything we do including our scholarship has to be humility that trinada pi suni chena is never ever left behind for a vaishnava and and so if all this question of dialogue with others dialogue with the world being reasonable and questioning at the same time of our faith all these things we talked about this is all founded on humility right on the ability to do that dialogue requires humility because it requires you to listen to others right and and uh, and being willing to supersede rationality requires humility on the part of the scholar because otherwise you think my mind is so great it's able to understand anything and anything beyond the rational world is not acceptable that faith requires humility as its foundation right so all of these things we've been discussing the the only way we have the capacity to do them as a vaishnava in other ways fine but as a vaishnava the only way we have a way to do this is through that foundation of humility it has to be there underlined beautiful i think this is a <coughs> this is a very uh, devotional point to conclude our discussion uh maybe i'll try to usually at the end of our discussions i try to summarize but we went over a lot of topics i try if we can and then if you want to add some concluding words we can do that so we discussed today you could say 
broadly on the topic of faith and reason in devotion in bhakti and uh, it started with your experience of you had education uh, homeschooling but that was protection not isolation and so you developed critical thinking at that time itself and it was not a it was not a big culture shock or a intellectual shock when you entered into academia and uh, the we they mentality comes primarily when we don't interact with people except to say speak down to them uh so if we we can see our faith as special but at the same time respect other people's faith also by seeing that there are different ways to approach krishna and <clears throat> then within the within the faith and reason dialogue in the academic world i think two main themes we discussed was the historicity and the principle of revelation so historicity it is very beautiful that before answering a question we need to question the question that why is this question important and in the abrahamic traditions because they have a linear conception of history so history is going somewhere and that's why where what happened when what happened and how becomes important but in our tradition history is not going anywhere the soul is going somewhere so the the how the historical events promote the soul's evolution is more important than the specific history or geography of those events itself so it's not so we discuss prabhupad's quote about not denying that ahobilam is where krishna appeared but uh, narsim appeared but not insisting on it so it's like not we are not a historical or non historical but history is simply like a departure point for us to go into the trans historical and and that so for us if we start giving a exam that we are not prepared for then we will get into trouble so do we want to give that exam also so we have to what is central for us is not the specific history so it is cause two like a pyramid one is to say history itself is literal history is itself important and everything that uh, this is how it is whatever the tradition says whatever and the other is that oh it doesn't matter at all it's what we start is more important it, it is all mythology so we understand its history but the more than history is what is critical for us what is the trans historical that is taught that's what we focus on and even in the historical like say we say krishna appeared here in vrindavan it's not the literal geography of radha kund but radha kund as it is seen in divya pratyaksha vidusha that is what is important for us so that was the hist- so historical question if we want to change the frame of the discussion we discussed about we have to go inside and uh, the, there is a lot of area for <coughs> going into the into the academic world and then like sarvam bhattacharya like yes yeah, sarvam bhattacharya spoke for 7 days to chaitanya mahaprabhu and then chaitanya mahaprabhu got to speak so some devotees who have the requisite supportive association to to sustain that hearing of things which are uh, of a non devotional perspective to things and then they also have the intellectual skills the nature to do that or they get the tra- they have the nature and they get the training for that then when they speak then they will be heard and then the the mainstream dialogue itself will the mode of the dialogue itself can be changed significantly and we can see that other religions have done that significantly but we hindus have not done, done hinduism vaishnavism or even our movement has not done that so much and then we discussed about the revelation question that um, so the religious uh, that the traditions approach is that a uh, religion is something which is consistent comprehensive and timeless whereas the academic academic scholars approach is that it is something historical philosophical social cultural or psychological these factors so with, with this conflict comes up so the same like the upanishads they are are they revelations or are they discussions in a, because of a political conflict between different regions that happened at a particular place so both of them can go together because we see that krishna can act by breaking through history descending into history or krishna can act through the movements of history itself 
and both can if seen that inclusive way they can increase our faith so the historic the transcendental circumstantial we could say both of them are are overlapping uh, are two simultaneous or overlapping modes of explaining the same thing and that way it doesn't have to necessarily challenge one's faith we discuss various examples for that purpose and then specifically with respect to faith and reason we had a long discussion toward the conclusion that that for reason is always a part of the okay if you want to talk about faith faith is dif- in our tradition faith is not simply based on beliefs okay this is what i believe that apart from beliefs this is what i practice this is what i have experience this is how i have seen my saintly teachers to be and this is how what i have say learned by studying scripture so there are so many aspects to faith and when one area becomes weak let's like when one leg when one leg is weak we rely more on the other leg and that's why while specializing in one according to our nature you also need to have enough time to appreciate the other sources of faith also because they may become the source of our survival at some time and and overall then you talked about you know how faith can rely on reason at a per initial stage then faith can partially rely on reason and faith can ultimately transcend reason but when it even when it transcend reason it doesn't reject reason it just doesn't rely on reason because even in our tradition say you talk talk about ramanacharya using reason to show how reason cannot prove the existence of god in the shrivastya or also our tradition has critical scholarship where you know okay this verse has this this versions so there is the critical attitude with the tradition also and ultimately for us uh the challenge if the rational rationality is just one way of thinking and it is it is valuable for both uh for us to understand krishna better and for us to explain krishna better to others and in between academic scholarship and say just the devotional practice devotional way of looking at things there could be traditional scholarship also so that is something which has not been so developed but as our movement is evolving that kind of spaces will be created and for us the same rationality which can help us to fix our mind on krishna can also obstruct us if if we start thinking that this is the only way or this is the superior way or this is the best way and we start looking down upon non rational devotees so if we have that vaishnava understanding that ultimately we are here for seva and my scholarship is one way of serving then we all can contribute in the lord's mission in the way that he has gifted us yes bro any points you want to add and conclude <laughs> that was amazing <laughs> your ability to summarize everything we spoke of uh, just points to your own brilliance as a devotee and as an intellectual so uh, thank you for that I, i have nothing to add or to subtract from uh, what you just said i think that's a good good overview and i'm just really really grateful that i had the opportunity to uh, discuss all of these matters with you it's so nourishing for my own krishna consciousness to have your association like this today i mean whether this video gets any views on youtube or not it really to me it's it's completely successful just for me to have your association in this way to discuss these wonderful topics i really really appreciated it it was uh, a really wonderful morning for me here in the us and i guess evening for you in india <laughs> you know for me also and i'm sure for many of our viewers it will be a very uh, it is a kind of discussion which is necessary but it doesn't happen you know there are certain stereotypes about what academic scholarship means and whether it should be done or not done and what are the challenges and uh, i feel that although i also discussed with different devotee scholars at different times about scholarship and uh, i different devotees come to me when they want to ask whether i should go into academy or not but i feel that a resource where one place we have a systematic discussion i don't think the resource like that is available so i feel that this will be a very valuable resource for uh, for many devotees in future also and i thank you for your time it was it was immensely relishable to have this penetrating discussion
थैंक यू वेरी मच हरे कृष्णा थैंक यू थैंक यू चेतन थैंक यू आई डेडिकेट करम टू वेरी बहुत प्लीज एक्सेप्ट माय ब्लेसिंग्स ओबेसेंसेस फ्रॉम